All righty. Let's get this show on the road. Any questions before we get started today? All right, then let's talk game no, plan. No, no. Oh, yes, I'm sorry, Ashley, go ahead. Um, this is way far in advance, but I was just looking at my schedule and I just some kind of a weird advanced person. Um, the test on the 15th, is that only this chapter 17 and 18? Uh, it, it covers basically three chapters, I think. Oh. It is the heart, it is the blood vessels, but it also is covering blood as well. Okay. So basically everything for the cardiovascular system. Okay. So is that, what chapter is blood? Do you know offhand? If not, it's okay. Uh, I don't off the top of my head, but hold on. Okay, that's fine. Well, I got the book right here. I know. Um, if you know, what is it? <laughs> yeah, if anybody else knows it, feel free. Uh, I think it's 17, at least in my book. Right, so 17, 18, and then what's blood? Yeah, 17, 18, and 19, that's right. Oh, so 17, 18, and 19. Beautiful, that's all, thank you. Yep. All right. Excellent. Any other questions? I had a question from the uh, lab, I guess. The lab book, Unit 17. Yes. Uh, There's a question that said, cardiac muscle cells are also known as blank, and that's smooth muscle cells. And then adjacent cells are joined together by blank, which allow the heart to blank. And I said gap junctions and send neural signals, but I didn't feel like that was right. Okay, so I'm sorry. Uh, read the question one more time. Okay. So uh, the part I'm confused about are cardiac muscle cells are known as smooth muscle cells. Mm -hmm. And then this is the part I'm confused about. It says adjacent cells are joined together by blank. And I put gap junctions. Well, you, yes, you are correct. Both uh, visceral smooth muscle cells and cardiac muscle cells have gap junctions that connect them together so that they work as one unit. So for instance, the smooth muscle of the walls of your stomach or your small intestine, you know, not like the erector pili muscles. Remember the, the smooth muscle in your erector pili muscles is multi-unit smooth muscle. So technically not all smooth muscle has gap junctions, uh, but single unit or visceral smooth muscle does. And so that is something that it and cardiac muscle do indeed share. I just didn't feel like that sounded right to me. No, uh, okay. Not all, and I think the reason for that probably is, like I said, not all smooth muscle has gap junctions technically, but most of the smooth muscle, especially the ones that are part of the uh, of the visceral organs, do. All right, thank you. Yep. Wait, uh, I guess I got a question now. Um, were, was the answer to the uh, the cardiac muscle cells are also known as uh, was it not cardiac myocytes? So I, I have an actually, which question is it? It's uh, on 466, it's number 10. The lab manual says yes. Cells of cardiac muscle known as cardiac myocytes. That's what I thought, uh, that's what I got. That's what okay. I have as well. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Okay. So is mine wrong then? You oh, I see. I, okay, I, I didn't read it closely. It says also known as. So I thought you meant we're similar to. I thought, I, I, I guess I had heard we're similar to as. Okay. So yes. Okay. But but if you change the word in on that, that would be okay as well. Okay. I understand where you're going with that. All right. Um, That's I I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't catch that part of the question. Yes. And remember also, when an assignment is due, like these unit reviews, uh, this afternoon, the key for it will be posted. So you will be able to uh, see the answer. Oh, yeah, that's you right. You get that immediate feedback. I'm happy to answer these questions, but do remember that they are there. Uh, someone else had a question? Yeah. I thought the cells were connected by the intercalated disc, and the gap junctions and the desmosomes were on the intercalated discs. Yes, and I would say that, that intercalated discs is fine as well. Sure, I would okay. say that, that was acceptable. All right. Excellent. Uh, all right, perfect. Uh, professor, I do have a question on um, the electrical activity of the heart worksheet. Yeah. Uh, when it's talking about the PQ interval and the PQ segment, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess I'm not too familiar as far as what the difference is exactly and how I'm supposed to describe what happens electrical and mechanical between those two. Excellent, which is probably an excellent reason why we are going to go over that stuff today. Okay. <laughs> so absolutely, yes, you are correct. I, I appreciate you getting the head start on the ECG stuff, but that's actually exactly what we're going to dive into in the very first thing we talk about today. So what I would say is to hold on to those questions till we have a chance to talk about it. And after we've talked about it, if you're still not, un- if you're still not clear, then I'll happy to answer the question then. Okay, great. Thank you. All righty. Excellent. Any other questions? All right, perfect. Then let's dive in. Oh, uh, yes. Dylan, you had a question? I assume you're typing, Dylan? Oh, there we go. Um, I'm, what I would ask you is if you, if you have questions about the quiz questions, that is something I'd prefer to go over in Open Lab. Uh, again, I'm not gonna release these questions. If you're, if you want, if you're curious about what you got wrong and, or, or why you got something wrong, I'm happy to go over that, but let's do that in my office hours as opposed to discussing the quizzes uh, uh, here in this format. All right? I have a small question. Yes. Um, sem, uh, semi-lunar valves, they close uh, louder than interventricles valves, right? Um, like, yeah, I of- guess I, I, I haven't thought of it in terms of the amplitude of the sound, but what I would say is that the pressures involved with closing them are probably greater Great. than the pressures involved in closing the atrioventricular valves. So based on that, again, my guess is because the morphology of them are both different. They have different shapes and structures to them. Uh, I don't think the force is the only factor that would affect that. Uh, but my guess is that probably the amplitude is a little bit. It's definitely dealing with higher pressures. That's definitely the case. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Excellent. All sorts of fun questions. I like this. Any others? That wasn't a, that wasn't a small question at all. That was a fun question. I like that one. All right. Anything else? All right, spectacular. Then let's move on into our lecture. We left off last time and we were talking about the spread of the electrical activity uh, that uh, are produced by our cardiac conduction system. We have that cardiac conduction system that is comprised of five components and we talked about and identified all of those. And as we left off talking about in the last class, this movement of electrical activity can be measured. And again, one of the important things to remember in this, when we look at this as we move forward, and where's my annotation, there it is, for the text for this. What we actually measure is twofold. What we are actually going to be measuring is twofold. It is going to be a change in uh, the Uh, change in the potential of cells and the movement of that potential. This is going to be one of the important things to remember because when we look at the waves that are formed with this, an upward wave doesn't mean positive and a downward wave doesn't mean negative. It's not like we're measuring actual voltage changes. We are measuring changes in potential and the movement of that change. And actually, let's say it that way. I like that better. And the movement of that change. So we're not talking about absolute values. Now, we'll be able to understand what those absolute values are, and uh, we'll try to make some sense of this. And of course, what did we say was the, the, uh, the instrument we use to be able to measure this movement of change? An EKG or an ECG, exactly, right? That electrocardiogram, right? ECG or EKG, like I said, depending on whether you're in Germany or not. Excellent. So what we see here is a graph that is formed by an ECG where we measure uh, certain deflections 
The deflections are the movements, the change. And this doesn't all have to be read. Um, in, in the line as it moves and deflects. And there are three main deflections. The first of those, come on. Oh, that's what I need. This one here, there you go, is the P wave. The P wave, and we'll use my highlighter here to emphasize this, is this first deflection right here. That deflection is caused by our impulse, our action potential spreading across the atrium. So what we have here is a depolarization uh, that moves across the atria. Now, we can simplify this a little bit, but let's emphasize this for points. And actually, you know what? I am going to redraw this. Let's do this on the whiteboard because that gives me more room to play with this because this drawing is a little small. So let's clear that. Let's draw this. All right, so we have our, pretend that's a flat line, and then we have our first deflection, and then we have our second deflection. Actually, you know what? Hold on. Let's start at the beginning. Perfect. There's our first deflection. And as we mentioned, this is our P wave. And as we also talked about, this P wave is a measure of the depolarization, or let's say this move this way the movement of our depolarization across the uh, atria. All right. Uh, yes, I will be grading the ECG worksheet for correctness. If you have already submitted it and you would like to go back and do it again, you're welcome to do that. All right, so let's think about this. We're measuring changes. So at this point right here, when the deflection just starts to come up, right before it starts to go up, that flat part, what percentage of the cells of the atria are depolarized? Excellent. At this point, 0% of the cells are depolarized. Excellent. And at this point right here, and I'm going to need to move this this way so I can cheat a little bit. What percentage of the cells are depolarized at the end of the P wave? Excellent. At this point, 100% of the cells of the atria, I know I didn't put that on the other one, are depolarized. And I think what confuses some people sometimes is they think the peak is where we reach 100%, but that's not what's happening. Think of it this way. If we were all sitting in the room, or there was a hundred of us sitting in the room, and someone decided to whisper a secret to the person next to them, right? At first, just two people know that piece of information. And then those two people tell two more, and now suddenly four know. And four go to uh, eight, and eight becomes 16. And suddenly, you see more and more and more people in the classroom learning that secret. But eventually you get to a point where more than half of the classroom or where half the classroom knows the secret. At that point, there are fewer and fewer and fewer people to tell. And as fewer people to tell, there is less change until we finally get to this point here where 100% of the people know the secret at which point there can be no more change. There's no new people to tell the information and there is no new change. And in fact, our line, whoops, it should not be purple. Let's keep it red to be consistent. Our curve flattens at that point. 
So the again, the, represents, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry, go ahead. Um, the wave represents um, the number of people know the information in this case, right? Right. It goes or, up. So in this case, instead of people knowing secrets, it's a hundred years atria. And again, this number is not anywhere near accurate, but let's say for argument's sake, your atria had 100 cells in it, okay? The first cell fires, and of course, where is that first cell that's gonna fire the action potential? Where? Anyone? Anyone, what's the first cell that fires the action potential that starts this process? It's SA. Um... True, be careful though, we have two nodes. So if we put what you guys said together, that works. The SA node, absolutely, the sinoatrial node. Because remember, use sinoatrial, no abbreviations in this class. Spelling does matter, right? So no abbreviations. I don't remember if we talked about it in this class. On lab exams, because I know some of you come from different 430 instructors. You do not have a test bank of, of terminology and words that you use on this exam. You are responsible for providing that information and spelling does matter. I will give you a letter if you transpose an I and E or something like that, or put a U instead of an O or something like that, I'll give you that. But otherwise, um, you will lose partial credit for spelling. And I see abbreviations as spelling errors. Now, if you were describing this process, then you can write out sinoatrial node the first time and then abbreviate it as essay after that. Or even you can write out an essay question and then have a key SA means this and AV means this as something like that. So you just have to write it out once during an essay question, but on a lab exams, make sure you write these things out. So I'm sorry. So, yeah, go ahead. Uh, wouldn't it be more of like a peak on a graph if it just you reach a point where less and less people get it, it would drop faster than that. Uh, true. But, but it, again, the other way to think of it too, is it's like waves along a pool. If you had a circular pool and you produced a wave at one side, as that wave spread, the wave would get wider as it started to cross the pool. But then as it started crossing towards the other side, it would start to get smaller again okay. until, it, until that wave completely covered the entire pool. And that's exactly what's happening here. What this is measuring, what this truly is measuring is basically the number of cells that are changing. Right, that's truly what this is a measure of. So at first, only a few cells are changing and then more and more and more and more are changing. But as most of the cells are changed, fewer and fewer and fewer cells are changing until they're all changed, at which case you're not back at rest. Notice your line is back where it was before, but the cells aren't back at rest. The cells are just no longer changing. So at this point, 100% of the cells are at rest None of them are depolarized. At this point, 100% of the cells are depolarized. None of them are at rest, but none of them are changing. And that's what I'm saying. This isn't a measure, this wave doesn't measure membrane potential. It measures change, okay? If we don't understand this, it's just about to get worse. So I wanna make sure we understand this. So any other questions on this? All right, notice then, our wave stops at the atria. It doesn't immediately go to the ventricles. In fact, as we've talked about, and we'll know why in just a second, notice on our wave here, there is a brief period of time where our wave is flat, where there is no change going on. Why isn't this change going immediately to the ventricle and changing the ventricle? Ashley, that's a great question. I don't have an answer for that. I don't know why it's the P wave. So. Uh, because of the border? Because it goes through the AV node. True, ah, there you go, it goes through the AV node. Notice, if it was traveling through the septum, if it was going down that interventricular septum, it would be moving. And if it was moving, we could measure it. Here, there's a brief period of time where there's no movement. This is the period of time when it's traveling through the AV node, the atrioventricular node, because what do we remember is special about the atrioventricular node? It's the toll booth. It is the toll booth, right. The cells are tiny, the cells are thin and small, and they delay, they slow the signal down. 
Because here's the other thing we know. While when the atrial cells depolarize, not immediately, but eventually, the atria will contract. Again, does this wave show us when it is contracting? No, it's not showing us when it contracts, but we know when a contractile cell gets stimulated, which is what we're measuring here, contractile cells contract. So remember, the AV node, we want to give time for the, the atria to contract before we contract the ventricle. So this right here, this little flat part, we'll identify what it is in just a second, uh, is that delay in the atrioventricular node. Then we get our third deflection, uh, pardon me, our second deflection. Our second deflection is interesting looking. There is a downward, oops, no, hold on. I want to go back to red. There is a downward deflection, then a large upward deflection, then a downward deflection, and then another upward deflection again. This and these individual points are known as U. The large peak at the top is R, and this third point is S, and so not surprisingly, this is called the QRS complex. In this QRS complex, notice it's more than just a single wave, not a single wave because not one thing is occurring. Two things, two changes, I guess let's say it that way, occur at the same time. What are the two changes that are taking place here in during my QRS complex? Well, once our, once our atria cells depolarize, do cells stay depolarized forever? No. No. So what's going to happen to a cell after it depolarizes? What does it do? Repolarize. It repolarizes wow. back to rest. Absolutely. So the one, first event that is occurring, at, and again, these are not sequential. These are occurring at the same time. The two things that are occurring at the same time are the repolarization of the atria. But what is else happening exactly at the same time? Excellent, Tina, we got depolarization, but de depolarization of what? Ventricles. There you go. Polarization of the ventricles. So those two events are occurring at the same time. We have a positive signal moving across the ventricles. We have a negative signal, basically a negative change moving across the atria. And these two things are moving at the same time. Uh, their polarities are different. So it gives us this big, weird, complicated or complex looking wave that we call the QRS complex. All right. Now, as you guys also pointed out, and I will emphasize this by sneaking this down a little bit and stealing in one more arrow. This Q point, as you guys mentioned, from the uh, atrioventricular node, our signal travels into the bundle uh, of his, down the bundle branches to the apex of the heart before it starts spreading up the ventricles. And that's what this Q deflection is. This Q deflection, the point of the Q, is actually when our electrical signal reaches the apex. So right here, this Q point, this Q deflection, is when our depolarization reaches the apex of the heart. All right. So far, so good? Yes. Excellent. So let's do one more thing. we have another flat part. So again, we have this transition period where there is no change. At this point when there is no change, and again, let's change colors. 
I'm sorry. What is the S point? RS points. It doesn't have. It does. There. There isn't a a, a major uh, movement that is associated with the S point. Oops, wrong button. Wait, why am I here? What do you guys see right now on your screen? Whiteboard. Oh, you saw the PowerPoint too? Okay. All right, let's come back no, here. All right. There we go. Okay. I don't know how I got kicked off the PowerPoint, but we're here now. That's the important thing. All right, excellent. So let's think about it. This flat part right here. What is the state of our atrial cells? Repolarized. All of them? No. Most of them. No? Well, is there any changes taking place? On that no. So if there's no changes no. taking place, then you guys are right. You were right the first time, and then you talked yourself out of it. 100% of the atrial cells are going to be repolarized. And what's the state of our ventricular cells? 100% depolarized. Excellent. All right. This is, um, I'm going to put ventricle cells just to save some space, are depolarized. Excellent. So at this period of time, this flat part here, again, no changes are taking place. And because there's no changes taking place, we don't measure any type of deflection, no type of curve. However, eventually, our uh, ventricle, ventricular cells need to repolarize. Ugh, nope. Red. And so we are again going to get our third deflection. Our third deflection is our T wave. And of course, we're just getting a simple wave. So just one event is occurring. And what is the one event we are occurring, we are measuring? And what is the one change we're measuring during the T wave? All right, the repolarization of the ventricles. And notice the T wave tends to be a little bit larger because if you've seen, there are more cells in the ventricle than there are in the atria. So there's more change to measure. And as we've mentioned at the beginning of this during the flat part, 100% of the ventricular cells are depolarized. So at the end of this process, what percentage of the cells of the ventricle are depolarized here? 100%. Well, yeah, 100% are repolarized. Oh, 0%. Right. Or, again, 0% depolarized. Cells of ventricles. And it's been repolarized or 0% depolarized. And notice at this point, our heart is completely 100%. All the cells of the heart are depolarized, which is exactly where we started. We started at the case here. Zero cells in the heart were depolarized. And at this point back here, we're right back where we started again. 0% of the cells of the heart are depolarized. At that point, our heart is at rest. And once our heart's at rest, our sinoatrial node goes off generates the electrical signal that spreads down the cardiac conduction system, and then the whole thing happens again. All right. So if we go back, let's go ahead and save that. Uh, go back here. So again, we have these three major deflections and out of the way. P wave, impulse is moving across the atria. QRS, we have two events that are occurring. We have our signal spreading down the septum about the ventricles. And at the same time, we also have the repolarization of the atria. And then the T wave 
is the end of the electrical activity in the ventricles. I've drawn it out on the board, but your book actually has a really great illustration that does a nice job of showing this. So here we see, again, our electrical signal starts in the sinoatrial node and it spreads across the atria. And as it changes the membrane potential of our atria, depolarizing those cells, we measure a change. Notice, once all the cells are changed, we no longer see any deflection on the graph. Instead, uh, what we see is that flat part. And again, the reason that flat part is occurring is because of the delay of the atrioventricular node. The electrical signal isn't spreading anywhere because it's slowly chugging through, as someone mentioned, the toll booth. However, eventually it starts to travel down to the apex of the heart and then spread up the ventricles. Remember when it hits the apex, that's the Q deflection. And notice at the same time that our depolarization is spreading up the ventricles, our atria are repolarizing. And these two different changes occurring at the same time give us this complicated complex, the QRS complex. Then we reach a point where the entire atria are repolarized and at rest, and the entire ventricle is depolarized. And we know that depolarization is going to lead to the contraction, right? but it's again not a measure of the contraction. And again, we reach the point where there's no change. But eventually, our ventricles need to repolarize, and the repolarization of the ventricles is that T deflection. And again, notice both of these deflections move upward. P is an upward deflection, T is an upward deflection. But notice, the P wave is the spread of a positive signal where the cell is getting more positive, whereas T is the spread of a negative signal where the cell is repolarizing, going back to rest. So as I mentioned, it's not a measure of the membrane potential, it is a measure of change. All right? And then at the end of this, once everything is repolarized, it is flat again. So we put all these pieces together and we have the spread, whoa, the spread of the electrical signal that can be measured in electrocardiogram. Yes, there's a question. Yeah, so at the beginning in the, um, in the you said that like that first little point of the curve, 0% are depolarized. Is that 0% of the atrial? Yes. So for the P wave, you're absolutely correct. So look at it this way. Notice here at the beginning, before the P wave starts, there's been no signal from the sinoatrial node, so none of the cells are depolarized yet. But notice, notice here, when we reach the end of the P wave, every single cell of the atria is depolarized. Just the atria. P wave just has to do with the atria. So now okay. here when it's flat, all of them are depolarized. Because so once okay. all of them are depolarized, there can't be a change. I'm sorry, say again? Is the T wave talking about just the ventricles then? And the T wave is just the ventricles. Notice at the beginning of the T wave, before the T wave begins, every single cell of the a ventricle is depolarized. And at the end of the T wave, every single cell of the ventricle is repolarized. So the T yeah. wave is actually the change from depolarized to repolarized. Okay. The T wave is the change from depolarized, I mean, from repolarized, or from rest really, to depolarized. Okay. okay? All righty. Great question. Any others? All right, excellent. So this is how our electrical signal should normally spread through our heart. And this is what a normal uh, electrocardiograph should look like. All right. However, as we mentioned, and as, as, uh, as was talked about at the beginning of class, there are more 
there's more information in this graph than just those changes. The values, the times associated with these can be important. So say for instance, uh, we see here uh, some examples of intervals, and I'm gonna write this here first. Intervals and segments. The easiest way for me to remind myself of the difference between an interval and a segment is that intervals include, so intra, intervals include the wave, whereas segments are instead between the waves. Okay? Let's see a simple example of this. For starters, let's talk about what the PQ interval would indicate. First of all, if I needed to draw, sorry, give me one moment. Um, this, and let's go ahead and do it with the highlighter. The PQ interval, as you can see, is from the beginning of the P wave to the Q wave. They cut it a little short, but I would say from there to there. How would you define the events or what is occurring or the significance of the PQ interval? Why would the PQ interval, what is it an indication of? What do you think the indication of? Depolarization. I'm sorry, say again? Depolarization of the atria. They're 100% depolarized. True, although really that would be just the P wave, right? Would be just the P wave, not necessarily including Q. So you've got the start of it there. You absolutely have the right idea. We've got half of it there. Um, oh, I like that. So Alex has kind of got the right idea. So you got the right. This is from the start of the depolarization. Oops, that's not where it's writing. Sorry, hold on, I'm putting this in the wrong place. So the PQ interval, if you think about it, is from the start of the depolarization of the atria to the start of the depolarization of the ventricle. All right. The very beginning of P wave is when that action potential occurs in the sinoatrial node and it starts to spread. The Q, as I mentioned, is when the signal reaches the apex of the heart and is about ready to spread over the ventricle. So might it be important to know how long it takes between what the timing difference is between when the atria start to, to be depolarized and when the ventricles start to be depolarized? Sure, excellent. However, how is this different from the PQ segment? What is the PQ segment? PQ. What would the PQ segment look like? No waves. It should, uh, should not have waves, you said, right? Yeah, maybe it's easier if we go back here. What does the PQ segment, excellent, Jessica's, Jessica's got it. The PQ segment is actually the flat part right here. So the PQ segment would actually be that flat part of the curve right there. Notice it's between, the segments are between the waves, whereas intervals include the waves. The PQ segment is the is where the, the the delay in the action potential is correct. Absolutely, exactly. So, oh no, I lost what I was writing because um, we changed. You've got absolutely the right idea. So, bring back my text. You are correct. The PQ segment is a measure of the delay caused by the atrioventricular node. Absolutely. And again, do you think that might be another important piece of information? This is the part where you all say yes enthusiastically. 
Yes. Yes. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure that was enthusiastic, but I'll take it. <laughs> All right. Absolutely. So notice there are lots of examples of these. We see a few examples here. Like I mentioned, the PQ interval, the beginning of excitation of the atria to the beginning of the excitation of the ventricle. Uh, notice the ST segment is that second plateau stage. This gives us a sense of the amount of time that the entire ventricular myocardium is all excited at once. It can give us an indication of how strong and powerful that contraction is going to be. Uh, there is the QT interval, although I will be honest with you, sometimes when you're asked to measure this as a nurse, they will sometimes use the RT interval. Let's talk about why it is first and then why you would use RT instead. Again, if you think about intervals include, so hold on, I'm trying to move these things out of my way, excellent. Uh, our intervals include, so again, we are going from Q to the end of T. So it would be from when the very first cell in the ventricle is excited to when the very last cell of the ventricle is excited. So it gives you an idea of how much excitation is going on in the ventricle. Now, when you as a nurse are dealing with the patient, they will often have you just do an RT interval. And why would they do the RT interval instead? It's an easier point to find. Yeah, exactly. It's an easier point to find. It's a hell of a lot easier to find that R than it is to find a Q when you're actually looking at an actual uh, uh, ECG. And is there really, when we're talking about, you know, hundreds of milliseconds, is there really that big of a difference between the Q point and the R point? No. no. So the R point is much, much easier. So often you'll be asked to take an RT interval. Technically, it should be QT because that's the more meaningful one, but RT is the easier one and basically gives you the essential same information. So, as was mentioned for that uh, ECG handout, uh, I want you thinking about and looking at some of these intervals and segments uh, and f trying to think of, all right, what are the electrical events that are being indicated here and how might they relate to mechanical events, right? How long the, the QT interval gives you an idea of how long the ventricle is going to be excited for. That does that tell you exactly how long it is contracting for? Is it a precise measure of the length of the contraction of the ventricle? No, these electrical events lead to the mechanical events, but they're not a precise measure of it. But if you have an idea of how long it, the ventricle is excited for, can you get a sense of how long it's contracting for? Are they related? Yes. So if there's a really long QT interval, then you probably have a longer contraction of the ventricle. Or conversely, if the QT interval is very short, typically a shorter contraction. So it's not a direct measure of mechanical events, but it is definitely going to be associated with mechanical events, and that is going to do that. Are they uh, far off from each other? Uh, a little bit. So again, there's, there's, there are really two factors that you have to think about when you're taking this into account. The first is, if you think about it, when we drew this and was talking about this before, when we generate a muscle action potential in a muscle cell, we know that muscle cell produces a twitch where there is a latent period before there is a contractile phase and a relaxation phase. Right, so that latent period means that there's a brief period of time, right? Often less than 10 milliseconds, but there is a brief period of time before the cell actually starts producing tension. Okay, so we're comfortable with that idea. We all kind of remember that from 430, latent uh -huh. periods and twitches and stuff like that. But here's the other thing. If you have just one cell in your ventricle contracting, is that gonna change the shape of the ventricle and pump it out? No. No, probably not. So the other issue we have is that we're not just relying on one cell to produce the tension. At some point, enough cells are gonna be excited and they're gonna be at enough different stages in their twitch where they're finally able to produce enough tension 
to change the shape and start pumping the blood. And in looking at this ECG, can we see exactly where that point is, where we have the you know, 15 cells with two of them being at 80% of their strength and two of them being at 50 and two of them being at 30, where suddenly we have enough tension to generate the force necessary to pump? No, there's no way for us to measure that. So it's, it's, we know it's in there, but, and we know the two are related, but there's no way we can precisely measure it. And that's really the important thing. This is the measure of electrical change. Obviously, electrical changes lead to mechanical changes, but this is not a direct measure of mechanical changes. And that is an important thing to remember because that's actually the thing we're gonna do next. The thing we're gonna do next is actually talk about the mechanical events that occur in the heart. All right, questions on that? I had read uh, online when I was trying to do the assignment that interval is used to measure time and segment is used to measure length. Um, that's just something I read, which I wasn't exactly sure what to think of it. So I wanted to ask you. Um, I'll be honest, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Think about it. When you're looking at a graph, this is a measure of change over time, right? So I'm not sure what length it would be talking about, except the length of time when we're looking at this. So I don't. I don't, I will not say that that is wrong because I haven't read it and I'm not sure where that comes from, but I'll be honest, that definition doesn't seem meaningful to me. Okay. Um, I think for the purpose, again, one of the things, so here's the one other thing that I would remind you of in this class. And again, those of you who had me for 4.30, uh, know and understand and appreciate this. My feeling that one of the things, the important things you have to remember in this class is in this class, the sky is blue, right? By that, my 13-year-old uh, is next door. And if I went over next door to her and asked her what, kind, what color, the, uh, you know, color the sky was, well, actually, she would just roll her eyes at me. But if I could actually get her to answer, uh, she would say blue, all right? But at night, is the sky blue? When it's raining, is the sky blue? At sunrise and sunset, is the sky blue? No. Does that mean she's stupid? Well, maybe a little bit, but no, what it means is that she's given us a basic answer that's right most of the time. And that's really what this class is about. We could literally spend this whole semester talking about the heart, right? I mean, every single component of the body we're talking about is far more complex than what we get a chance to talk about. So in this case, in this class, the sky is blue. Right? When you get to nursing school or medical school or wherever else you get to, then you get to learn about when the sky is gray and the sky is purple and the sky is green. Um, hope this guy's not green, uh, but you get the rest of all the rest of those. And, but in this class, the sky is blue. May length be a meaningful term in some other context related to this? Maybe, I can't imagine off the top of my head what it would be, but cardiovascular is not my area of expertise. But for us, and most importantly, because I'm the one who writes the tests, the way I see the difference between them is that intervals include the waves and segments don't. So if I give you an ECG and ask you to draw the segment, the PR segment or the PR interval, make sure you understand what those things mean. All right. Hopefully that's a satisfactory answer. Yeah, uh, I did have one question though about the QRS complex. Yes. Um, do we ever talk about those like points individually or do we always just like say QRS complex? Or like an you, answer. I would say Q is the only one that, that we typically talk about independently. Um, sometimes when you're diagnosing problems with the electrocardiogram, you may talk about the amplitude, the relative amplitude of R, because that can be an indication of how rapidly and how powerfully you're stimulating the cells. So sometimes uh, you can talk about the overall amplitude, and since R is the big spike, you're kind of talking about the amplitude of R. Uh, but but Really, again, as we talked about, those that those the two those pardon me those three work together as a complex because those two events are occurring at the same time. All right. And Levon, did I answer your question from before as well? Yes. Excellent. All right. Any other questions then about this? All right. Excellent. 
So we have now talked about what a normal ECG looks like when things happen normally the way that events should normally occur. But that's only normally occurs if, again, everything is normal and healthy and if our signal is originated in the sinoatrial node. As we talked about, every single cell of the cardiac conduction system is autorhythmic. Now, the sinoatrial node is usually the one that fires first, and when it fires, it spreads to all the others, and we produce that uniform wave that we see here in the ECG. But all the cells are capable of becoming autorhythmic. So if suddenly this one fired before all the others, right, you would start to get this asynchronous firing of the different um, cardiac conductive cells spreading through the contractile cells. And when you talk to a cardiovascular surgeon, when they're working on a heart that has an arrhythmia, it often looks like a big bag of worms because you have all these different parts of it contracting at all those different times. And of course, is that something we could see on an ECG? Yeah, absolutely. We would see that as something that is known as a fibrillation where we're getting rapid, uh, irregular contractions of different muscle fibers in the heart from that asynchronous activity that is going on. And how do they typically try to fix it? If someone's in ventricular fibrillation, how do you try to fix it? They can zap you. Yeah, clear, chunk. And what are they doing when they do that? And the electricity through your yeah, body. Yeah, basically you're putting a big, huge electrical signal into the heart because the goal is to get all those cardiac conduction cells to all be stimulated at the same time. Because if they all depolarize at the same time, they'll all repolarize at the same time. And as we know, that sinoatrial node is the one that has the highest firing rate. So if they all fire at the same time, they all recover at the same time, then the sinoatrial node should be the one that fires first and we can reestablish that normal wave. So in that fashion, we try to reset the heart, right? Basically, it's our way of unplugging someone for three seconds and plugging them back in. See if we can reset the modem. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. So, as I mentioned, those are the electrical events that are going on in the heart. And now we've even seen how we can measure those electrical events. But what we need to do now is talk about, right, the mechanical events. But before we finish that, I mean, before we start that, the last thing that we kind of already hinted at, and we talked a little bit about in the last class, but now I'll make you angry by reminding you of things you didn't want to think about. We need to talk about how we control it, All right? Our basic heart rate is intrinsic. It is autorhythmic. And of course, as that means, as we mentioned, it is capable of producing its own action potentials. All the cells of the cardiac conduction system are capable of doing it, but our pacemaker cells, those sinoatrial node cells, Fire at what rate again? What do we say the firing rate of the sinoatrial cells were? Anyone remember? I wasn't paying attention either. It's all right. Come on, I'll wait. What is the firing rate of the sinoatrial cells? How many times does it fire? 100. Yes. 100, there you go. 100 beats per minute. Is that what your resting heart rate is right now? No. No, because as we mentioned, while it is intrinsic, we have the ability to modify it. Excellent, and what are the ways that we can modify our heart rate? The AV node. Excellent. Hormones are one of them. Absolutely. I like that. Well, remember the AV node is part of the, um, the, is part of the uh, 
cardiac conduction system. So we want other things. So hormones like adrenaline or other things like that. Um, okay, let's, what about exercise? What is it about exercise? Is it actually the exercise that makes your heart beat faster? What is it? The nervous system. Yes, exercise, stress, all of those types of things are our autonomic nervous system. Now, we haven't talked too much about hormones yet, but I saw someone write, wrote down adrenaline, and that's a good example. Can anybody think of any other hormones that might play a big role in regulating heart rate? It's okay if you don't know them yet. I'm just curious if anybody can pull one. Anyone else know a hormone that plays an important role in regulating our heart rate? Cholinergic. True, although those that those are uh, you're thinking of in terms of the neuroreceptors and things like that that are there. Uh, how about thyroid hormones? Thyroid hormones, human growth hormones, stuff like that. Like I said, it's okay if you don't know those. We'll get to those in a bit. And remember, norepinephrine is just a, a fancy name for noradrenaline. Nor, uh, epinephrine and adrenaline are the same thing. So yeah, noradrenaline let's put the, or norepinephrine. Uh, so although I feel weird putting norepinephrine on here and uh, not epinephrine. Oops, that should all be one word. Excellent. All right, so those we have. But let's talk about things we do know. Our autonomic nervous system. Let's start easy. What are the two branches again? Sympathetic and parasympathetic. Excellent. Parasympathetic and sympathetic. And as we talked about when we talked about heart rate already, what neurotransmitter does our parasympathetic nervous system release to the heart again? Acetylcholine. Acetylcholine. Excellent. Acetylcholine. Sorry. <laughs> I'm saying as I write it. <laughs> no problem. And as long as you spell it right, that's all I care about. And what neurotransmitter did we say that our sympathetic releases? Norepinephrine. Norepinephrine. Oops. Excellent. What did that acetylcholine do on our conductive cells again? Um, open the sodium channels. Was it sodium channels that are acetylcholine? What did I say? I meant acetylcholine. What is our acetylcholine open? Did I, say, I don't remember if I said acetylcholine or not. It's parasympathetic nervous system, acetylcholine. What is it open? Chloride channels, excellent. Oh, chlorine, yeah. And of course, what effect does that have on the heart rate? It slows down. Right. Decreases. Lowers or decreases. Oh, I like decrease, that sounds fancier. Decreases heart rate. Excellent. Norepinephrine, on the other hand, did what? Increase. It is going to increase. Yep, absolutely. It's going to increase heart rate. But how? Open calcium channels. Calcium? Uh, sodium. Sodium. <laughs> sodium channels. There you go. And that increases the heart rate. Excellent. Perfect. Let's add one more thing. What was the parasympathetic pathway from the brain? So again, we'll go from brain stem. We'll make it easy that way from you. From brain stem to heart, what is the pathway of the parasympathetic nervous system that is used to innervate the heart? your ganglion or there we go you guys have the right idea excellent vagus nerve what's the other name for the vagus nerve again cranial nerve there you <laughs> go. cranial nerve number 10 yeah, excellent cranial nerve 10 right our vagus nerve and you are correct it then innervates a terminal ganglion that then innervates the heart. Excellent. That was super easy. And in particular, what we'll see is in the heart, it primarily innervates, let's see it down here. 
innervates the SA node and the AV node. So as we talked about, it can lower heart rate, slow the heart down. Excellent. That was the easy pathway. Let's talk about the sympathetic pathway. That, of course, starts in the lateral gray horn of the spinal cord. And what is the pathway that we use to get to the heart? The posterior um, gray horn? Nope, we go from the lateral gray horn, okay. goes out the ventral root to the spinal nerve. And from the spinal nerve, where does this axon go? This preganglionic neuron, where does its axon go? Sympathetic ganglion? Yeah, to a sympathetic ganglion, excellent. Which one? I know the students who had me had this information. I don't know how many of the rest of you did, but I know at the time that you had it, you were hoping you wouldn't have to use this information again. There you go, we're getting closer there. It is indeed the cervical chain ganglion. Do you remember which one? Middle and inferior, excellent. Cervical chain ganglia. And then of course it synapses and then we have a sympathetic nerve and that then goes to the heart. And when it gets to the heart, it innervates the SA node, the AV node, just like the parasympathetic, but also ventricles. So notice our sympathetic nervous system can speed up the heart, the rate of the heart, and increase the strength of the contractions. And again, you might not have thought of it in those terms, but when someone gives you a big scare, not only does your heart beat faster, but can you feel it trying to pump out of your chest? Yeah, absolutely. And that is because unlike the parasympathetic, it innervates the SA node and AV node, but it also innervates the ventricles. So it can affect the rate of the heart rate, but also the strength. I've got a lot of words here, but let's make some sense of it with a pretty picture. Here we see the pretty picture and we see that. Notice here in our parasympathetic, which is the easier route coming out of the ganglion in our brainstem, our vagus nerve, cranial nerve 10, basically carries the information all the way down to terminal ganglia that are right here, right next to the heart, where it innervates the SA node and the AV node. Our sympathetic pathway starts in the lateral gray horn, out the ventral root to the spinal nerve, down the white ramus. It ascends to that middle or inferior cervical trunk ganglion where it synapses. And then a sympathetic nerve travels to the heart where it innervates the SA node, innervates the AV node, and also innervates the ventricles, allowing it to increase heart rate, but also increase the strength of the contraction. All right, isn't that fun? Wasn't that enjoyable to go back and remember that again? Much fun. I won't make you hold, remember the white ramus and all of that, but should you know uh, that the sympathetic pathway comes from the middle or inferior cervical chain ganglia or trunk ganglia, should you know that uh, the pat and a sympathetic nerve, should you know that the vagus comes out the cranial nerve? Absolutely. 
And then of course you need to know what neurotransmitters they release. Uh, you need to know the, what those neurotransmitters do and then how they, um, how they modify the heart rate. What is that yellow arrow? The one that goes from What yellow arrow? Oh, this the one? one? Goes... Oh, yeah. um, what it is showing is basically what is called an upper motor neuron. These are uh, central nervous system interneurons that basically carry the information from the nuclei. The decision isn't actually made in the lateral gray horn. That's just where the preganglionic neuron is located. Decisions are actually made up in the brainstem, and then the brainstem carries that information in what is known as an upper motor neuron uh, to the lateral gray horn, which then carries the information out. So it's just part of the central nervous system pathway where they're carrying that information. The brain is where the decisions are made. All right. It's the outward path, the motor path that I'm interested in. All right, questions on that? Fun with nervous system. Excellent. All right, with that then we, oh, I'm sorry, was there another question? Yes, no, okay. All right, excellent. With that now, we are Can done with, oh, go ahead, yes? Back to that drawing part or the other slide that you wrote on. The one before uh, that. Oh, never mind, never mind. Oh, I think what you're talking about is, hold on, let me go back enough spaces. All that stuff? Is that what you wanted? Yeah, can I get a picture of that real quick? Thing? Sure. And again, remember, you can always go back to the uh, recording and get this information here as well. Tell you what, we are stopping here because we're actually getting ready to move on to our, uh, our cardiac cycle, which is the mechanical events. And so this is actually a good place for our first break. Let's go ahead and take our first break and I'll just go ahead and leave this on the screen so that anybody who wants to copy it down can do that. All right, my clock says 117, so let's come back at 132 and restart at that point. Uh, and then I will start the recording at that point. All right, any questions before we take our break? All right, I will see you in 15 minutes. Thank you, thank you for Excellent. Good thing we didn't get into anything important yet. All right, excellent. So talking about cardiac cycle, all the mechanical events that occur in the heart from one action potential, one ECG uh, that is doing. And again, the goal is to move the blood. Yep, from P to T, exactly, right? If you think about when, uh, and really it, by one ECG, what I really mean is one, you know, action potential that is spreading through that cardiac conduction system that we measure with the ECG. The point of these mechanical events is to move blood through the heart. And what drives the movement of blood through the heart? What is the most important force in the entire world? Absolutely, pressure. Pressure is what makes the world go around, absolutely. And of course, to produce pressure changes in the heart, ah, wrong buttons. We have to change the volume of the heart. So our goal is we have this muscle, and again, remember it's in circle fascicles or figure eight fascicles to form those chambers. We are going to change the volume of the chambers, and changing the volume of the chambers is going to change the pressure in the heart, and that change in pressure is what is going to move the blood. So absolutely, pressure changes. Um, let's go ahead and erase that one is what is going to drive the movement. And what causes those pressure changes is the contraction and relaxation of the chambers, plural. Okay. Here is the pretty picture uh, from your textbook uh, that kind of shows this process in the steps of this process. What I like to do, as, as those of you who've had me before know, when we have a long, uh, uh, physiological process, I think it's easier if we go over it once together and then we come back to the book and look at the pretty pictures and look at the charts and look at all those things. But for this first time, I really encourage you to just put your pens and pencils down, uh, just sit and watch and think and listen and try to make sense, make sure it makes sense to you. Now also, as you can see here, they've got the pretty realistic pictures of the heart. So for simplicity, 
I'm just going to use my schematic drawing of the heart that we've used a couple times. So let's go to our whiteboard. I think I already saved this, but I'll save it again just to make sure and then clear it. And let's talk about the heart. So again, our goal here is to do the cardiac cycle. We are going to start with a heart and this heart and it's four chambers. Right, are here, and we're going to start a point where the heart is completely at rest. Now, when I say the heart is at rest, what I mean is that both the atria are at rest and the ventricles are at rest. Of course, there are fancy words that I can use when we talk about the cardiac muscle of the heart being at rest or being contracted. What are those fancy words? Anyone know the fancy words related to when the heart muscle is contracted and the heart muscle is relaxed? Excellent. One is a state of dialysis, I mean di diastolysis or diastolic. And what's the other one? Systole. Systolic or a state of systole. Absolutely. Excellent. So in this case, the heart is completely at rest. Uh, the atria are uh, diastolic. And the ventricles are diastolic. Excellent. And I think I can sneak this down a little bit more, although this is going to be hard to move all of this. But let's see if we can get it to work. All right, move that down a little bit. Oh, no, same thing. Move that down a little bit. And move that down a little bit. Perfect. Excellent. Okay. Now, um, we know that blood, well, let's go get to that in a second. Um, so we know the state of the chambers, both the atria and the ventricles are a state of diastole. They're diastolic. The other thing we need to know about what's going on in this period of time is the state of the valves. So our semilunar valves, are in what state? Are they going to be open or closed? Closed. Closed. They're going to be closed. And what about our atrioventricular valves? Open. Excellent. Are going to be open. Excellent. So uh, for simplicity's sake, let's Do this, that there, that there, and let's make it a little bigger. Open, open, open. I'm gonna do it a little nicer on this one and then I'll make it uh, less fancy on the others, but we'll, cause we'll have this one to lean back to. All right, so we have those. So now what I need are some passageways. So we have, oops, wrong color. We have our spear vena cava, inferior vena cava, and now, as we know, our coronary sinus all going into the right atrium. We have our four pulmonary veins going into the left atrium. Well, our left ventricle feeds out, in, uh, pardon me, our, our right ventricle feeds out into the pulmonary trunk and then the pulmonary arteries. And our uh, left ventricle feeds out into the ascending aorta. And as we mentioned, and let's change the colors, our atrioventricular valves are open. And our semilunar valves are closed. Oops, hold on. I want that one. No. All right. Uh, I'm sorry, Jessica, do you have a question? Oh, there's a question. Okay. Uh, no, that's not true at all. The heart is absolutely at the starting part of the cardiac cycle. By rest, what I mean is that none of these cells are contracting. None of the muscular cells in these are contracting. So again, you remember, your heart is not like a faucet where you turn on and it continually flows. There is 
there, so at this, well, at this point, not only am I not talking no change, but I mean that every single cell of the heart muscle is relaxed. The muscle of the heart is doing nothing at this point in time. It is just at rest. Now, that doesn't mean that something isn't occurring during this period of time. Absolutely, something is occurring at this period of time. Yeah, so partially between the beats, absolutely. Because as we know, blood is going to be entering into the right and left atria. There will be some blood that accumulates in here. So let's go ahead and make a wavy line to remind ourselves that there is gonna be some blood in here. However, is the blood necessarily just gonna stay here in the atria? No. No, uh, because you're typically sitting upright and these valves are open, then that blood is just going to drain right on through into the ventricles. And so this period of time when the heart is entirely at rest, what we are actually getting is a passive filling of the ventricles. So the heart is completely at rest and we are getting a passive filling of the ventricles. And in fact, about 80% of the volume of blood that the ventricles get, it actually gets just from this passive filling. All right. Questions on that? So this is our starting point. Our starting point is this passive filling of the ventricles. All right, excellent. Now, if we think about the electrical events that we know are going to occur, the first place that an electrical signal is going to be produced is at the sinoatrial node. That electrical signal is going to spread across the atrium. And then once it spreads across the atrium, those atria are going to contract. Now, obviously, if the atria are going to contract, they are going to pump blood into the ventricles. So at this point, we are going to get if you're contracting, you're using energy. So we are gonna get an active, and let's not actually even put that in parentheses. We're gonna get an active filling of the ventricles. So let's see if we can draw this and define these things a little bit more quickly. Not red. Heart. There and there. All right, so what is happening is we are getting a contraction of the ventricles. Oh, pardon me, of the atria. Oh, yeah, contraction of the atria. So again, if we think about this down here, our atria are now in a state of systole or systolic. But what about our ventricles? Diastole. Diastolic. They are still diastolic. And actually, in the interest of space, let's start abbreviating this. A for systolic, our ventricle is still diastolic. Our semilunar valves, what is their state? Closed. They're closed. They're still closed. And our atrioventricular valves, what is their state? Open. Open, excellent. Perfect. So again, our, and I'm going to cheat here with the blue. So this is still closed. This is still closed.
And so some blood, some remaining blood is being actively pumped into the ventricles and our ventricles are filling up. Whereas they were less filled before. All right, excellent. Questions on this? All right, now's where things get fun. What's going to happen first, as we know, is that electrical signal with a delay, given our atria a chance to contract, are going to start to relax. And that signal is spread to the ventricle and it's gonna to start to go up to the ventricle. So as we draw our heart over here, ah, stop it. Our atria start, well, let's say just say that our atria become diastolic. They stop to contract. But at the same time, our ventricles begin to contract. They start systole. When this occurs, we get a minor increase in pressure in the ventricle. And that change in pressure is significant because that change in pressure, that small change in pressure is enough to cause the atrioventricular valves to close. <coughs> And when they close, we hear our first sound. All right? We hear that lub sound from the closing of the atrioventricular valves. So at this period of time, our atrioventricular valves slam close. All right. However, what about our uh, semilunar valves? Are they going to open necessarily right away? After no, the contraction. They're, they are still closed. Right. But at the beginning of the contraction, they're still going to be closed. Notice at this period of time, oops, blue. There. Notice at this period of time, all of our valves are closed. There's two significant factors that are occurring at this time because of this. That is still open. And that is still open. All right. Good enough. So at this period of time, there's two significant things that are happening. The first important thing that is happening here is if the AV valves close, can we get any more blood into the ventricle? No. Right, so no more blood can enter the ventricle. At that point, we have the maximal amount of blood in the ventricle that it can have. And we have a fancy name for this. We call this the end diastolic pressure. Oops. Because now the ventricle is entered systole it is no longer diastolic and no more blood is coming into it. Okay. However, there is a second important event that is occurring here. Notice as the ventricle continues to contract, as they continue to contract, the pressure in the ventricles increases. increases. However, with all the valves closed, can we change the volume of blood that is in it? No. No. The volume of blood in the ventricles stays the same. 
right? I don't conveniently enough have one here, but if I had a bottle of Snapple and I sat here squeezing that bottle of Snapple and my pressure was getting greater and greater and greater on that bottle of Snapple, would I be able to change the volume of Snapple that was inside that bottle? No. No, no I'm not gonna have the strength to be able to crush that bottle and shoot water or juice or whatever it is out of it, right? So this period of time, pressure is changing, but volume isn't. And we give a very special name. This period of time doesn't last for a very long period of time. This is a very short period of time. But we give this very short period of time a very important name. This is what we call the ISO volumetric Contraction. Contraction is obviously we're contracting, we are generating force. ISO means what? Isolated. No, not, not in this case. It can, but what does ISO mean? Same, like an isosceles triangle has the same side. ISO volumetric means same volume. So the volume stays the same, but the pressure goes up. Uh, in this case, no, temperature change here isn't significant. Okay. All right. Now, again, the pressure in those ventricles is going to get greater and greater and greater. And so eventually, the pressure in the ventricle is going to become greater than the pressure in the arteries. So again, we have, let's say it this way, pressure in the ventricles continues to increase and eventually it becomes greater than the pressure in the arteries. When that occurs, what happens? Are the semilunar valves open? Exactly. At that point, our semilunar valves are going to open. So this pressure opened the semilunar valves, right? I'm sorry? This pressure in open, opens the semilunar valves. That is correct. This increase in pressure. So the pressure, hold on, let me finish drawing the rest of this stuff and then we can do that. Oops, no, no. All right, remember, our arteries have blood in them. But when the pressure in here gets so much greater that it's now bigger than the pressure inside of the, uh, then in the, so again, it's contracting more and more and more and more. So big contraction here more and more pressure. And eventually what happens is it is able to force these valves open and force blood into the arteries. So at this point, those semilunar valves are forced open. And let's move this out of the way over here. When that occurs, we force this open. And again, let's stick with our, what is the state of our atria at this point? Diastolic. Diastolic. What is our, um, that way. Systolic. What is our ventricle? Systolic. 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 Yeah, now it's in full uh, systole. Fully systolic. Uh, what is our state of our semilunar valves? Open. Yeah. Open and oops, yeah. And the state of our atrioventricular valves? Closed. 
closed. Excellent. So we have that. At this point, the pressure in the ventricle is greater. We force the blood out into the arteries, and we actually call this stage ventricular ejection. Where we are now ejecting the blood out of the ventricle into uh, the arteries. All right. Questions so, on that? So when the pressure uh, drops in the uh, ventricular, um, ventriculars, the pressure in the um, aorta higher, and that's why the semilunar uh, valves close again. Exactly, which is exactly the next step. You absolutely <laughs> have hit it on the head. So let's do that. You are correct. Eventually, and my spacing is a little off here, but you guys can bear with me on this. Excellent. So you have the right idea. What's going to happen now is that our ventricles start to relax. Right? As they start to relax, as they start to enter uh, diastole, as they start to enter diastole, then the pressure in the ventricle decreases. And when the pressure in the ventricle decreases in relation to the pressure of the arteries, where you've just shoved a whole bunch of blood into them, the blood doesn't like to be in a high pressure position. And so the blood tries to re-enter the ventricle. But as it tries to re-enter the ventricle, what does it do? It slams the semilunar valves closed. So now our semilunar valves get slammed closed. All right. There, and there, and there, and there, and there, there, and there, there, and there. So again, our blood tries to get back in, but when it tries to get back in, it slams the semilunar valves closed. Yep. So notice again, a couple things are occurring at this point. Now we have reached the most amount of blood that we could pump out of the heart. Do you think we get all of the blood out of the heart? No. No, it'd be nice to think it is, but heck, just think of a can of soda. Are you ever able to get all of the soda out of a can of soda? There's always that one little drop at the bottom. No matter how much you shake, you can't get it out. So what that means is at this point, we have pumped out all the blood we can out of the heart, out of the ventricle. So it is at its lowest volume. And that point of its lowest volume is called the end systolic volume. Notice one other thing is happening during this period of time. Now during this period of time, the pressure in the ventricle is decreasing, but with all the valves closed, the volume stays the same. This is a brief, this is a brief period of time, but guess what we call this brief period of time? Isovolumetric relaxation. It's gonna be the isovolumetric, whoa, move that out of the way. And let me do that. There you go, excellent. It is the isovolumetric relaxation, absolutely.
All right. Questions on that? All right. So there's one more thing we have to talk about with what's happening. And let's remind us this by using some pink arrows. The whole time that these valves are closing and the ventricles contracting and, relaxate, and relaxing, let's not forget that blood is still continually returning to the heart. And as blood continually returns to the heart, our atria are slowly filling up with more and more blood. And eventually, I guess I can sneak it in over here. Eventually, as the ventricle relaxes, fully relaxes, the pressure in the atria is now higher than the pressure in the ventricle. And when that occurs, what happens? AV valves open. Excellent. At that point, the AV valves open. The entire heart is at rest, and we are now back at the passive filling of the ventricle. And the cycle continues. I have a question. I have uh, an answer. Do the ventricles ever reach like 100% volume? Like, do they ever fill up to 100%? Uh, no. <laughs> so it, it's it's a little it's a tricky question to ask answer because one of the things that happens as the ventricles fill, they're not a rigid bowl. Like, if you had a rigid bowl you could fill it to its maximum. However, they're more like a water balloon. As you put more water into them, they expand to accommodate more. Now, of course, with a water balloon, you can get so much in there that it will eventually burst. And we can't get so much blood into the ventricle that it will burst, but mm -hmm. it is able to expand to accommodate more. So again, it, it may look full-ish, but because it can expand, it is able to accommodate more. So. I'm going to say the sky's blue answer is no. We can't fill it to its 100% capacity. Okay. And would it be like the more blood you can get into your ventricles in this time, like the more efficient your heart is? Well, as we will see, how much blood you get in there does absolutely affect... Um, oops, didn't mean to grab that. I'm trying to grab this instead. There we go. Um, as we'll see, it does affect how forceful of a contraction it produces. It does affect how much it goes out. So how much blood is moving through your heart and how much blood is filling your ventricle while you're sitting here at rest versus if you were exercising, it is going to be different. Okay. Yeah, so it is gonna dynamically change depending on your activities. All right. Uh, yes, there's another question. Yeah, so in the isovolumetric relaxation, the atria and the ventricles are relaxing? So if the atria have been relaxed for, uh, for basically the past three steps. So there's gotcha, gotcha. a relax. So you're right. Yeah, I guess we didn't do that for this one. We should sneak this in. Can you guys see if I write it down here? Atria yes. are uh, diastolic. The ventricle are starting uh, diastolic. Yeah. Uh, and then, like I said, the key with this is the semilunar valves are closed and the atrioventricular valves are closed. So all of that is all of that is occurring. So yeah, it is still diastolic at that point. And, and with, during the isovolumetric relaxation, the ventricles are starting diastole. And then when it's completely uh, diastolic, then uh, that's when the relaxation occurs and passive filling is going to begin again. That answer your question, Karina? I assume that means yes. All right, excellent.
Uh, well, the dub is the semilunar valves closing. Yes, right? absolutely. And I'm sorry. Oh, good call. Absolutely. This closing of the semilunar valve here is absolutely when we get the second sound, and that is the dub. Absolutely. Thank you for catching that. All right. Uh, chat window question. Uh, oh, perfect. Excellent. All right. Other questions on this? Let's go through it all again now. We've done it here. Let's look at the pretty pictures from your textbook that show the same thing. And again, here we see the cycle, but let's go through it step by step. As I mentioned, we are going to start first with our ventricular filling. With the ventricular filling, uh, we have the heart at rest, both the uh, uh, atria and the ventricles. What is the state of the AV valves in this state? Open. Open, right? And during this period of time, we just have the passive, right, filling of the ventricle, about 80%. Again, one of the keys to this to remember is that this is a passive process. No uh, ATP is being used. There is no uh, contractions that are going on. It is just simply a passive process. The remaining filling, about 20%, occurs when the atria contract. Our atria enter a state of systole, their volume goes down, their pressure goes up, and they push the remaining blood into the ventricles. All right, this is going to fill the ventricles, and again, it doesn't occur till, sorry, pardon me for one second. Sorry about that. All right. Um, so remember, the maximum volume we're going to get in here is that end diastolic volume. And that occurs, remember, when the valves close, the AV valves close. The AV valves close because our ventricle starts systole. Our atria start to relax. Our ventricles start to contract. Whoa, I'm not sure what that's doing there. Uh, we get that isovolumetric contraction. That looks really weird. I'm not sure why. Our ventricles start to contract. That causes the AV valves to close. Our semilunar valves are still closed. So since all the valves are closed, the volume cannot change. Pressure increases. Volume stays the same. And that is our isovolumetric contraction. Our ventricles continue to contract, and the pressure gets greater and greater and greater until eventually the pressure in the ventricle becomes greater than the pressure in the arteries. And when that occurs, our ventricles increase their pressure. I'm not sure why the formatting of this is off. I do apologize for that. Um, and the blood enters into our great arteries. Eventually the ventricles start to relax. When they relax, our semilunar valves close as the blood tries to force itself back in. That causes our semilunar valves to close, giving us our dub sound, as was pointed out, of the lub dub. Our atrioventricular valves are closed, so now we have a set volume in our uh, ventricle. The ventricle is relaxing, but the volume stays the same, so the pressure decreases, volume stays the same. The ventricle isn't empty we have that end systolic volume. And again, here, if we'll look at the pretty picture. Oh, last one. As it relaxes, eventually, the pressure in the atria becomes greater than the pressure in the ventricles. The AV valves open, and the process continues. And again, here is that pretty picture from your textbook that Kind of does exactly what we did, only a lot, lot prettier. It shows us the state of the valves when they're opening and when they're closing.
Um, notice it shows that brief period of time where all of the valves are closed, both during isovolumetric contraction and isovolumetric relaxation. So we see that there and the changes and the blood sounds. And in fact, this chart is part of a pretty picture. Where is that? Oh, I guess I lied. Huh. All right, your book's got this great picture uh, that does a good job of putting all of these pieces together that can be a little intimidating. But the other way to describe this that I think is a really excellent way uh, to see these processes and how they relate and how they occur is this pressure gauge. So we can see this here with the pressure changes. Now this is particular for the left where the pressures are a little greater, uh, but uh, remember the same thing or at least similar thing. In the right, just with smaller pressures. And again, as we've talked about, what makes the world go round is pressure. So here we see the pressure changes, and as those pressure changes, it affects the mechanical events. So let's work our way through this, starting first here. Notice at this point right here, when we're looking here, the pressure in the atria is slightly greater than the pressure in the ventricle on the left side, so left atria, less ventricle. The pressures are slightly greater in the atria because it is receiving blood, and that blood is flowing from the atria into the ventricle. Notice something interesting happens right here there is a slight increase in the pressure in the atria and therefore a corresponding increase in pressure in the ventricle. What causes that increase in pressure in the atria? AS node. True, and what does the AS node do? The AS node doesn't actually increase the pressure, but you're right, ultimately it is the cause. What happens? First, first action potential. Okay, and that action potential spreads across the atria. And then what do the atrial cells do? Depolarize. They contract. Yeah, you're right. Contract. They depolarize and then they contract. Notice when they contract, they increase the pressure and they pump the blood into the ventricle. So notice, if you think about it, this is the passive spread of the blood to, uh, to the ventricle, the passive filling of the ventricle. And then this one here is the active filling of the ventricle. So here we see the two events where we are uh, passively and actively filling the ventricle by uh, just passive movement and, um, and the contraction of the ventricle. All right. Then our ventricle starts to contract and we see an increase in the pressure of our ventricle. And then something special happens. Right here. Right here, something special happens. What is the special thing that happens right here at this period of time? The AV valves close. Right, why? Why do the AV valves close? You're absolutely correct. But why that's do the good. AV valves close? What is this graph showing us that's occurring that the, tells us why the AV valves close? The ventricle is starting to contract. Yeah, the pressure in the ventricle becomes greater than the pressure in the artery. Uh, pardon me, in the atrium. In the atrium. Right, in the atrium. And as we know, fluids don't like to be in high pressure environments. So if the pressure in the ventricle goes up, it wants to leave the ventricle and it sees, hey, the pressure is lower there in the atria. I'm going to start to go back into the atria. But as we know, as it starts to go back into the atria, it slams those uh, AV valves closed. Sorry, AV valves closed. Notice the other place that the blood could go would be into the aorta. But look at the pressure in the aorta. The pressure in the aorta is really high. Is there enough pressure in the blood right here to force that semilunar valve out and push that blood into the aorta? Not no. yet. So notice at this point here, all four valves close. And as all four valves close, 
we start to see an increase in pressure, but the volume stays the same. So what would this period of time here, this little region here in the dark orange represent? Atrial systole? Well, uh, no. Notice pressure is going up, but the blood can't go anywhere. So pressure goes up, but the volume of blood in the ventricle stays the same. So this is our isovolumetric. There you go. Isovolumetric contraction. Contraction. Excellent. Then, as you guys pointed out, as it continues to contract stronger and stronger, the pressure of our uh, ventricle becomes greater than the pressure in the aorta. So what happens at that period of time? Ventricle ejects. Right. This forces open the semilunar valves and the ventricle is ejecting blood out into the artery. And as it fills the artery, the artery pressure goes up as the ventricular pressure goes up. Down. But notice eventually the ventricle starts to relax. As we know, pressure doesn't instantly go back to, down to zero, but the pressure starts to go down. And as the pressure starts to go down, eventually the pressure in the mm -hmm. ventricle becomes less than the pressure in the aorta. And what happens at that period of time right there? The semilunar Semi valves close. Semilunar valves close. Excellent. The right. dub sound. Exactly, here's where we get the dub sound, absolutely. So we got the lub right here, and then we got the dub right here. Excellent, we got those right there. Well, let's be consistent. Perfect, we have that. And then notice as that occurs, our pressure continues to decrease, but all the valves are closed. So what is this dark orange period of time referred to as? Isovolumetric relaxation. Volumetric relaxation. Excellent. I do want to point one last thing out to you. Notice before we finish the rest of this chart, one other interesting thing is happening. Notice up here in the aorta, when the semilunar valve closes, there is actually a spike in blood pressure. Anyone know why that might occur? The myelinar valves push the, when they close, they push the pressure on the blood to go up. You kind of got the right idea, absolutely. Remember, what's happening is the uh, pressure is great in the aorta, and the aorta wants, and the blood in there wants out. So it tries to go in the ventricle, and the door slams closed on it. So think of it this way. If you are in a concert, and you and 3,000 of your closest friends are trying to get out of that concert, and someone would suddenly slam the door in your faces, right? The first person would bounce up against the door, and then the second person would bounce into the first person, and the third would bounce into the second, and everybody would kind of bounce into each other as a result of being stopped all of a sudden. Basically, what would happen is you would produce turbulence, and that turbulence produces pressure, and that's exactly what's happening. You're absolutely right. The slamming of the door in the blood's face produces this turbulence, which causes this little spike of pressure, which is known as the dichrotic notch. So that dichrotic notch is caused by turbulence from the slamming close of that semilunar valve. Now notice as the ventricle relaxes and the pressure goes down more and more and more and more, eventually we reach a point where the pressure in the ventricle becomes less then the pressure in the atria, and when that occurs, what do we call that? Or what event happens then? When the pressure in the ventricle becomes less than the pr pressure in the atria, what happens at that period of time? Passive valves open. Uh, yeah. The AV valves open. Valves open. And at this point, we again start our passive filling of the ventricle, and the cycle continues. Um, yes. The aorta kind of stays the same um, pressure unless it's exerting the blood, right? I'm sorry, say that again? 
So the, a the aorta kind of just stays the same with pressure unless it's... For the most part. So if you look, if you notice, and let's do this with the highlighter. There is a slow decrease in the pressure in the aorta. And that's the reason for that is blood that's in there is slowly being propelled forward, right? The pressure gradient is, the pressure is less further away. So blood is slowly moving away. And as blood slowly moves away from the aorta, down the aorta, there's a little bit left behind and the pressure goes down. Then we fill it with a bunch of blood and the pressure goes up. We then get that slam into the door, which bounces the pressure, giving us that pressure spike. And then slowly the blood moves down the aorta, up the ascending aorta to the aortic arch, to the descending aorta, to the brachiocephalic artery and all the other blood vessels. And as the blood moves, the pressure slowly decreases again. Uh, professor, so yes. with, the, um, with the atria, uh, so basically throughout this whole period of time, there's only one, since there's only one instance of contraction, is it just constantly going through passive filling itself? Yes. Yeah, remember, there's no valve on the, uh, on the superior vena cava or inferior vena cava or those pulmonary veins. So blood is constantly returning to the heart, and they're constantly passively filling. Got it. Okay. Yep. And uh, two atrias, they um, filled out and drained the blood at the same time? Uh, approximately. There's, there, there, there are slight asymmetries in the closing of the valves. Basically, uh, the left side, because it's dealing with higher pressures, tends to close before the right side do, but it's, it's very close. An easy way to remember, they actually close in alphabetical order. So if you think about it, the aortic semilunar valve closes before the pulmonary semilunar valve, and the bicuspid valve closes before the tricuspid valve. But they're very, very close. Right. So okay. is, if you are, if you are just, if you're just listening, if you've got your head on somebody's chest and you're listening to the lub dub of their heart, you just hear the lub and the dub as individual sounds. If, as in your lab manual, it talks about you actually take your stethoscope and find the precise location, you can actually isolate each individual valve and hear each individual valve. And then you will see there is a slight uh, asymmetry to when they close. They're very close together in time, but they're slightly off. All right. Any other questions on that? All right. So we did that. We did all of that. And uh, clear this. Oops, did we pass? No, okay, I didn't. Perfect, excellent. So, and this is exactly what we were talking about right there. The lub is caused by what again? Atrioventricular valves. Atrio valves. Dub is caused by the closing of the semilunar valves. Sem valves. Absolutely. And again, here we see the actual regions where you can as actually oscillate each individual valve and kind of isolate them and be able to hear them. Yes, absolutely. All parts of the aorta have different blood pressures. In fact, uh, the uh, proximal part of the ascending aorta has a different pressure than the distal part of the ascending aorta. That's actually those pressure gradients, as we'll learn, is how we actually get blood to move through the body. Blood moves from a high pressure to a low pressure environment. So yes, so pressure gradients is going to be how we get blood to move from one place to another throughout the blood vessels. All right. And like I said, the reason alphabetical is an easy way to remember, but it's also easier to remember the left sides basically close faster uh, because they're dealing with the higher pressures. So the greater pressure changes, the higher pressures cause those the left side to close first. All right, excellent. There we go. This is what I was talking about. I knew this chart was on here somewhere. So notice we can put all the pieces together. Here we see the electrocardiogram, the electrical events. Notice the P wave is not a direct measure of when the atria contracts. The QRS is not a direct measure of when the ventricle is contracting. They're not directly related. One event causes the other event, uh, but they're not directly related. We can see when the valves close, giving us our lub and our dub. 
right? We have right there at the beginning of the isovolumetric contraction and at the beginning of the isovolumetric relaxation. That's when all the valves are closed. We can see all that. And again, they all relate to those mechanical events we've seen here. If you look on this chart, there is one piece that's missing that we need to add in, and that is how much blood is actually moved. And that's a little bit about how much blood is actually moved is this graph right here. Notice we are measuring the volume of blood in the ventricle. So notice at first, wait, where is, there it is. At first, we are getting a gradual increase in volume of blood in the ventricle, then a little bit of a spike when the uh, atria contracts. Then notice, and let's highlight this with the marker, there is a period of time where the volume doesn't change. Yellow doesn't show up at all. This period where it doesn't change is the isovolumetric contraction. Right, Our atrioventricular valve is closed, so we can't get any more blood into the ventricle. But our semilunar valve is closed, so we can't get any blood out. So the volume stays the same. But then the volume, the pressure in the heart becomes great enough to pump the blood out. And as we eject the blood, the volume goes down. And then the heart relaxes. And finally, the semilunar valve closes. And when the semilunar valve closes, the atrioventricular valves are still closed. So the volume stays the same during that isovolumetric relaxation. And then slowly we start filling it again once the atrioventricular valves open. Remember we gave values to this maximal amount of blood we could get into the ventricle, the end diastolic volume and the value of the blood after ejecting it out, the end systolic volume. So if we actually wanted to know how much blood was moved by one ventricle during one cardiac cycle, how would we calculate that? Subtract the, what is it, the end dice? Uh, end diastolic volume or volume versus uh, from the end systolic volume? There you go. You would subtract the end systolic volume from the end diastolic volume. And conveniently enough, they have these numbers here for us. 120 is our end diastolic volume. 50 is our end uh, systolic volume. So what would that work out to? 70 milliliters. How many? 70. 70 milliliters, excellent. 70 milliliters, excellent. And that we have a name for that volume. The name for that volume is the stroke volume. So our stroke volume is the amount of blood that is moved by one ventricle during one cardiac cycle. And what do we know about the stroke volumes of the left ventricle? versus the right ventricle. What do we know about the relationship of those two? Same. They are the same, excellent. Excellent, both sides deal with different pressures, but they both move the same amount of blood, which we can see here, clear. All righty. How are we doing? We are doing good. Excellent. 2.30. Perfect. All right. Questions on that? All right. I'll leave this here because it puts all the pieces together. Let's go ahead and take our uh, second break at this point. It's 2.32 right now, so let's return at 2.47. And at 2.47, we will restart the lecture. And I will try to remember to restart the recording again. All right, questions on any of that? I have a question. Yes. Um, I forgot about what's the difference between cardiac output and the stroke volume? We're going to do that next. That's exactly oh, okay. Where we're Excellent question. Okay. Perfect question because that's exactly where we're going next. Awesome. All right, any other questions? 
All right, I will see you in 15 minutes. All right, excellent. We had a great question right before the break, which is a great feed into what we were talk about to talk about next. And that is to talk about cardiac output. As I just finished mentioning uh, before, there's my annotation code, uh, to tools, look at that now. Our stroke volume is the total amount of blood that is pumped by one ventricle during one cardiac cycle. All right. So the question was asked then, how does that relate to cardiac output? Well, cardiac output is the total amount of blood that is pumped by one ventricle during one minute of time. So while we know how to calculate stroke volume, how did we cook, calculate stroke volume again? And diastolic volume uh, subtracted or subtracting and systolic oh, volume. Yep, and diastolic volume minus the end systolic volume. How would we calculate cardiac output? Cardiac output is obviously going to be equal to is going to be related to stroke volume because that's how much blood is pumped in a single beating of the heart. But how do we calculate it for one minute of time? If only there was a measure of how many times your heart beat during a minute. Heart rate, the there heart you rate. go, absolutely. So you multiply this times the heart rate and you get the amount of blood pumped from one ventricle in one minute of time, and that is indeed your cardiac output. So cardiac output is equal to stroke volume times heart rate, or heart rate times stroke volume. So as we just calculated, if you think about it, we just calculated the last time, our stroke volume we said was about 70, right? Because it was 120 minus 50. What's an average heart rate? 60. 60 to 80. I heard 60, I heard 80, let's split the difference. 70. 70. All right, so 60 to 70, 60 to 80, somewhere around that range. Let's go ahead and put 70, because it's a nice round number, All right? Or we could do 80 or something along those lines. So 70 times 70 equals what? 490. 490. 490. 490? 4,900. 4,900. Yeah, absolutely. Basically, five liters. In one minute of time, your heart, one ventricle of your heart, pumps about five liters of blood. And remind me again, what is your volume of blood that you have inside of your body? Five liters. About five liters, absolutely. So in every single minute, your entire volume of blood is pumped through your body. And that's with a rate of 70 heart rate while you're just sitting here at rest. When you're exercising, when you're running up three, three flights of stairs, it gets even greater. All right. So again, I think we did all that, but we can do it here. You measure beats per minute for your heart rate. 70, and you know, so I use 75 because again, it gives us a nice value of 5250 with our average blood volume being a little over five liters. So like I said, every uh, minute, your entire uh, volume of blood is moved through your blood at rest. 
when we are exercising and exercising vigorously, obviously we have the ability to pump our blood much faster than that. Towards that end, we can actually calculate what we call the cardiac reserve. The cardiac reserve is basically what your resting cardiac output is and compare that to what your actual maximal cardiac output is. At your peak maximal level of uh, activity. For mere mortals like you and I, we tend to have a cardiac reserve of about four or five. So let's stick with five and let's stick with our previous number of five liters. So if at rest, whoops, hold on. If at rest we can move five liters per minute, what would our cardiac output max be if our max was, if our cardiac reserve was five? One. <laughs> Close. Think of do it the other way. Instead of dividing, what do you do instead? Twenty-five. Twenty-five. Absolutely. You multiply it. Twenty-five liters. So again, your cardiac reserve five over one. So it's five times as much. So that's twenty-five liters. When you're exercising vigorously, running that marathon, you know, doing that sprint running from that bear with an ax, whatever it is that you're doing, you have the ability to pump about 25 liters of blood per minute through your body. And like I said, that's just us mere mortals. If you are a professional athlete, many professional athletes have a cardiac reserve of about seven to eight, meaning they can pump between 35 and 40 liters of blood through their heart every minute. And if you think about it, that's just one side. It's happening on both sides. That means your heart it's in, in its entirety, or their heart in its entirety, is pumping 80 liters of blood in a single minute. Like I said, the heart's not much to look at, but it is amazingly efficient. Its physiology is truly, truly remarkable. All right. Yes, go ahead. Cardiac output resting is always five liters because that's how much blood you have. Uh, it's not because of that's how much blood you have. It's just what the average is. Again, everybody's average is going to be slightly different. Everybody's going to have a different size heart. So certainly not everybody's cardiac, uh, pardon me, not everybody's stroke volume is going to be 70 milliliters, right? In fact, in a class this small where we only have 32 students in it, uh, the, um, oh, actually, gosh, I'm sorry. I hate to do this two hours in. Uh, three hours into the class. I don't know if there's anybody left who's still trying to add the class, but unfortunately, despite my best efforts, I have not scared anybody off. So I actually do not have space for any more students. So if you are trying to add the class still, unfortunately, I will not be able to add you today. And if I can't add you today, you, uh, we were just going to keep falling too far behind with the materials and other stuff. So I will not be adding any more students this semester. So I do apologize. Uh, I should have mentioned that at the beginning of the class. I apologize for that. If there is anybody left, I unfortunately will not be able to add you. So I do apologize for that. All right. Uh, it's not an easy thing for you to test by yourself to figure out how much volume, uh, how much blood is being pumped through the heart. There are ways to test it, but it's fairly invasive because the heart is on the inside of our chest to be able to see how much. There's some imaging ways and things like that that we can calculate it, but this is just an average. So yeah, and, and again, in a class this small, as I was about <clears throat> to be distracted, probably nobody in this class has precisely 70.0 milliliters as their stroke volume. All right, so again, everybody's stroke volume is gonna be slightly different. Everybody's resting heart rate is gonna be slightly different. So uh, again, five liters is an average uh, but it's also the average of the volume. But no, your, that's a great question. Your resting cardiac output is not going to be always equal to whatever your blood volume is. We're kind of rounding on that to show that. Uh, Ryan had a question. Oh, Will, yes, so absolutely. And that's one of the things we're gonna talk about next. Now that we know the basic understanding of how to calculate cardiac output, our next question is always gonna be, all right, now that we understand it, how are we going to modify it? 
And if we're going to modify our cardiac output, well, then there's two main things that we can change. Those two thing, main things we can change are going to be heart rate and stroke volume. So those are the two things that we're going to want to manipulate to be able to change the cardiac output. And yes, absolutely. Stroke volume is one of those things that we will be able to change. And yes, blood vessel is going to be one of those things that, uh, yeah, changes during exertion because uh, you're pumping more blood into it. But uh, you're also dilating more blood vessels. So again, it, it does vary. I have a question. Yes. So the CO, that, uh, the cardiac output that we calculated, is just about one half of the heart? Yes. Is one so it's, side it's, of the heart? It's one side of the heart, absolutely. And remember, whatever's happening in one side of the heart is happening in the other side of the heart. So we, we can double it. If you wanted to think of the total amount of blood that was being moved by your entire heart, yes. But as we said, remember, eat, well, your heart is really two pumps doing different things. So when we, when we think about it, when we talk about how much blood is being pumped into the aorta or how much blood is being pumped into the pulmonary trunk, that's what the cardiac output represents. If you wanted to know how much blood was being pumped into both of them, then yeah, you could double it. And that oh, would, yeah. okay. Thank you. Yep. All righty. So let's manipulate our cardiac output. No, remember both ventricles move the exact same amount of blood. Right. Otherwise, we'll actually talk about what happens when they don't. When they don't, then we have problems. So we'll actually see what happens when they don't. We'll actually talk about that. But no, in a healthy, normal individual, the left side and the right side move the exact same amount of blood. They're just moving them at different pressures. Excellent. Alex is correct. Move the same amount, but the pressure is very different. Left side, because it's got to go everywhere, is a much higher pressure. Right side, because it's just going next door to the lungs, is a much lower pressure. All right, so let's manipulate these things, starting first with the regulation of our heart rate. Remember, if we're gonna change cardiac output, we either need to change our heart rate or we need to take our, change our stroke volume. Oh, try that again, there we go. So here we again, our goal is to modify cardiac output. So we can either modify heart rate or we can modify stroke volume. The good news is we've already talked about how you moderate your heart rate. We know it is gonna be hormones and we know it's gonna be our autonomic nervous system. These are the things we just finished talking about before. So remember we start in the brainstem, primarily in the medulla oblongata for our autonomic nervous system. Our sympathetic pathway, remember, goes out the lateral gray horn to the middle or inferior a cervical chain or trunk ganglion, and then that sympathetic nerve to the heart, parasympathetic via the vagus. And remember, we had this pretty picture that reminded us of it last time. However, again, notice one of the things that we talked about is because of this difference in the innervation, our sympathetic nervous system is also able to influence not just increasing the heart rate, but increasing the force of the contraction. Whereas remember our parasympathetic, because it just affects the sinoatrial node and the atrioventricular node, can only affect heart rate. So it just decreases heart rate, whereas the sympathetic increases heart rate and increases the force of contraction. Now, Again, our goal is to maintain homeostasis. We want to maintain a normal, healthy blood pressure. And the primary way we um, monitor this is what are called baroreceptors. But baroreceptors is really a fancy word for a stretch receptor. These are stretch receptors in the blood vessels. And these stretch receptors in the blood vessel respond to stretch of a blood vessel. A blood vessel, like the heart, like a water balloon, as you fill it with more blood or as you put more pressure on it, it is going to stretch. And so when it stretches, that is an indication of more pressure. What's cool about these baroreceptors is they are constantly firing action potentials. They're constantly firing action potentials, all right? 
However, they respond to stretch. When they stretch more, and I'm gonna move my arrow just because it's pesky and in the way. When these stretch receptors stretch more, so when there's more pressure, there's gonna be more stretch. And when there's more stretch, they fire more action potentials. When there's less blood pressure, and I guess we should be more specific, blood, less blood pressure, uh, there's less stress, stretch. And when there's less stretch, they fire fewer action potentials. And so it is the change in their firing rates that sends a signal to the medulla oblongata that tells it to change the heart rate. If blood pressure is dropping, there's less stretch, fewer action potentials go to the medulla, and the medulla says, uh-oh, blood pressure is dropping, and it sends a signal down the sympathetic nervous system, and the sympathetic nervous system increases heart rate, increases the force of contraction, more blood is pumped into the vessels, and more blood means more pressure. Remember, when we're talking about fluids, when we're talking about gases, they push against the boundaries. Again, I'm going to have to work on my analogies because usually I do this when I'm in the classroom. If we were sitting in the classroom, I could blindfold all of you and let you roam around the room. And as you roamed around the room blindfolded, every once in a while, you guys would bump into the walls. And I count the number of times you guys bump into the walls, and that tells me my pressure. If I double the number of students in the class, then that means people are going to be bouncing into the walls a lot more. So the more people I put in the room, the more they bounce on the walls, the greater the pressure is. And it's the same thing with blood. The more blood you put in a vessel, the more it stretches, the more it's pressure. All right. But as we talked about, and we talked about our neural pathways, so hopefully you have that down pretty well. We also talked about there are chemical signals that can regulate the heart rate. As we talked about, hormones are a big one, our epinephrine, our norepinephrine, and those thyroid hormones that for right now, today, you can get away with calling them T3 and T4. However, in the next section of the class, when we get to the endocrine system, does anybody actually know the actual names of T3 and T4, the two thyroid hormones? Thyroglobulin? Close. It's related to that. Now, one is thyroxine, and the other is triiodothyronine, which, yes, you will have to spell at some point. All right, excellent. But for right now, you can get away with T3 and T4. These are all major, obviously, stress hormones, epinephrine and norepinephrine. T3 and T4 are major metabolism hormones, increasing metabolism, therefore increasing heart rate. But as someone mentioned earlier, changes in ion concentrations, changes in sodium, changes in potassium, changes in calcium levels, those are all things that can modify heart rate. But as we also talked about, there are many other factors, age, gender, your physical fitness, body temperature. How does age change heart rate? What typically happens to heart rate as we age? Heart rate increases. Well, it's kind of a tricky question, right? So you got, so you've said increases and I've seen slows. Both are true because it kind of depends on your period of time. If we're talking about from baby to adulthood, what happens to heart rate? Slows. It slows, it drops, absolutely. If you've ever listened to the heart rate of a baby, right, it is alien almost in how fast it is going. Or you listen to it actually when it's in utero, right? It sounds like a hummingbird or something like that. So typically as we get larger, as we grow, our heart gets bigger and as it gets bigger, it gets more efficient. And as it gets more efficient, the rate decreases. But you guys are also right, as we go from adulthood towards being more elderly, as our heart weakens, as our blood vessels lose their elasticity and become less effective, what happens to heart rate then? Rises. Yeah, it starts to rise again. So at first it drops, and then as we get older, it actually starts to rise again. Excellent. Gender? Yeah. 
Who typically has the higher heart rate, males or females? Females. Females have the higher heart rate. Why is that, of course? That's right, because guys are better. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> well, size, again, think, if, think of it's primarily size. Who's got the higher heart rate, the hummingbird or the elephant? Hummingbird. Hummingbird, hummingbird right? Typically, smaller in size means uh, uh, a slightly you know, smaller volume, and so typically means a higher rate. Now, does that mean that every single female's heart rate is higher than every single male's? No, not any more than every single female is smaller than every single male's. We're talking about one averages, when we talk averages over an entire population of species on this planet. And two, while these things may mathematically, uh, uh, statistically be significant, are they clinically significant? No, of course not. There's no, you know, there's no significance from a clinical standpoint. It's really just math. Right. All right. But what about physical fitness? How does that affect? As we are more physically fit, what typically happens to our heart rate? Slows down. Yeah, it goes down typically because our oh. more physically fit. We are more um, efficient. The heart muscle, just like our skeletal muscles, get more efficient at pumping, and heart rate typically goes down. And when your temperature goes up, what typically happens to your heart rate? Heart rate goes up. Heart rate goes up as well. Absolutely. Right, that's part of the problem with those polar plunges, right? Winter's right around the corner, places like Chicago. Chicago's a great example, they do this all the time in Chicago. Cleveland does it in the uh, Lake Erie and all these kind of things. There's lots of these places where the water freezes over, comes close to freezing over, and on the winter solstice, they all run out and they all jump into this freezing cold water, right? And one of the problems with that is as you jump into ice cold water, that rapid change in body temperature can cause a huge surge in our parasympathetic nervous system that can actually stop the heart, All right? Because temperature, decrease in temperature decreases heart rate and that dramatic change can actually cause the heart to stop. All right? Uh, professor, so uh, if our heart rate increases uh, with temperature, is it because of uh, it's trying to release a lot of excess heat in the blood? Probably, because at the same time when you get warmer, typically the blood vessels on the surface dilate so we can bring that heat to the surface. Uh, Levon, so the elderly have a higher resting heart rate, but during exercise, their maximum BPM is lower than younger adults. Um, not necessarily. Again, if you start with a higher heart rate, if you exercise vigorously enough, then it will also rise above. Again, uh, part of it, if you're, if elderly people may not be as efficient at exercising, so if they're not able to, you know, sprint as fast or, or swim as fast or things along those lines, their heart rate might not necessarily, but I don't think the maximum is necessarily as dramatically affected uh, by age as it is by other factors. All right, so I think we've got heart rate down because like I said, we've talked about that several times. Let's talk about ways that we can affect stroke volume. Stroke volume remembers how much blood, and we're gonna cheat and draw a circle here, and this is just gonna be the ventricle, so I'm not gonna draw my normal schematic heart. We'll really just simplify this by having just this being the ventricle. Because if you think about it with the ventricle, we have one way in, And of course, that one way in is the uh, atrioventricular valve. And we have one way out. And that one way out is into an artery. And it really doesn't matter uh, which one of those it is, left or right, it's all gonna be the same. Now, preload refers to how much blood we can actually get into the ventricle. That's what preload is. Again, remember, our job is to fill the ventricle and a lot of that is passive. The atria is just pouring the blood down in there. So when we talk about preload, primarily it is about uh, increasing, there's two effects here. The first is increasing the rate of blood return to the heart. 
Think of it this way. Your ventricle is a water balloon and we wanna fill that water balloon. You're sitting at the sink, we'll fill in the water balloon. One way you could fill that water balloon faster is by turning up the faucet more so that more water fills it. If you turn up the faucet, more water is gonna fill it in three seconds than it was filling it in three seconds before. So doing things like constricting blood in our skin, constricting blood vessels in our digestive system, all of those are things that can help to move the blood quickly back to our heart. We talked way back in 430 about how our skin was a blood reservoir. There's a tremendous amount of blood just chugging along slowly in our skin. So one of the things that happens when we get scared, when we get stressed, is we get more pale. Because when we're stressed and we're in that life and death situation, our skin blood vessels, the superficial blood vessels, constrict to draw the blood back to the heart faster. The other way you can get more water in a balloon is not just by turning the faucet up more, but leaving the faucet the same and leaving the water there, balloon there for a longer period of time. So the other thing we can do is increase the relaxation of the uh, ventricle. Because remember, it's the beginning of the contraction of the ventricle that closes the semilunar valve and stops more blood from coming in. So if we delay the contraction of the ventricle, we can get more blood in it, All right? That's the key with this preload. We get more blood into the ventricle. Now, obviously, if there is more blood in the ventricle, there's more blood for it to pump out. But there is a second advantage to getting more blood into the ventricle. I'm gonna write this here and then I'm gonna erase it because I'm gonna show it on the pretty pictures. The second advantage to getting more blood into the ventricle is it stretches the ventricle. Right, we talked about that water balloon. If you put more water in a water balloon, that water balloon stretches. And as we get more blood into the ventricle, as the ventricle stretches, the ventricle gets more efficient. It can produce a more powerful contraction. Now, how the heck does that work? How can the length of the muscle cell affect how much tension you produce, the strength of the contraction? Does that concept sound at all familiar to anyone? It's like building how muscle. How long a muscle cell is can affect how much tension it can produce? The slingshot. Slingshot's a good example of that, of how that works, absolutely. But can you relate it back to what we talked about in skeletal muscle? Anybody remember back in skeletal muscle when we talked about a similar concept? Apparently not. not Excellent. When we talked about skeletal muscle, one of the things that we talked about is how we could change how much tension you could produce in a single muscle cell. And the way you can do that is by the starting length of the skeletal muscle. Let's take a really simple example of a skeletal muscle or of a sarcomere. Let's take a really simple example of a sarcomere. Here's my myosin. Here's my actin. Here's my Z disc. And here, are my myosin heads. Now, 
in this super simple example, right? How much tension you produce is determined by how many myosin heads can grab and how many can perform power strokes. So in this super simple illustration that I have here, how many of the myosin heads can actually grab onto and pull onto active? Four. Four. One, two, three, four. And that's it. So at this length, this sarcomere can produce four myosin heads worth of tension. Now what happens if I stretch this muscle out? If I stretch this muscle out, say for instance, and we'll just, again, super simple. I just stretch out this side of my sarcomere. How many myosin heads can grab and pull now? Two. 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 <laughs> How many myosin heads can grab and pull now? None. None. So how much tension are you going to be able to produce by this muscle cell? None. None. Right? And again, as we talked about in 430, or you should have talked about in 430, this should make sense to you. Because when you're at the bar on Friday night, back in ancient times, you used to be able to go to a bar, right? And someone was drunk and rowdy, and you have uh, some bouncer there trying to stop somebody who's trying to throw a punch. Or nowadays, it's just, you know, somebody hanging out at a Walmart who doesn't want to wear a mask. Right? One of the things that you can do to subdue them is to take their arm and pull them behind them. When you pull their arm behind them, you're stretching out the muscles, weakening the tension, and they can't throw that punch anymore. Someone much smaller can subdue someone much bigger by stretching that muscle out. Conversely, if you shortened the muscle cell a lot, notice at this point, all the myosin heads can grab onto actin, but with the actin overlapping, is it going to be easy for those myosin heads to perform their power stroke? No. No, and so tension is going to go down. So again, the other way you can subdue someone is you can wrap them up and, you know, bundle their arms against them. If the arms are contracted, it's hard. They can't generate as much force. So you can stretch their muscles out or you can shorten their muscles. Either way, you make them weaker. Well, what you're looking at right here is how the heart muscle starts. It's able to contract and produce force, but it's not at its most efficient length. The more you fill that heart, the more it stretches the heart muscle out, and as you stretch that heart muscle out, it becomes more and more efficient. Now notice all eight myosin heads can grab and pull. This is gonna become super powerful, produce a super uh, powerful contraction. Now, is it possible to overinflate the ventricle and stretch it out too much where it becomes less efficient? Yes but you'd have to really force a lot of blood in there for that to occur. So instead, uh, what happens is as the heart fills with blood, it becomes more efficient. Again, this should not be a new concept. Back in 430, we talked about how the length of a muscle affects the force it can produce. If this is all Greek to you, then go back to the skeletal muscle and look at that chapter again and read that part to make sure it makes sense. All right. This ability to make it stronger contraction by stretching it is a very important concept that was actually discovered essentially at the same time by two uh, physicists, not physicists, uh, uh, pardon me, two physiologists. These two physiologists uh, discovered it at the same time, both wrote papers at a very similar time, and there was a huge massive debate that went on between these two individuals after who this property should be named after them. One of them uh, was by the name of good old Bob Frank. The other was Bob Starling. And again, as we know, because scientists are stuff, such reasonable and understandable people, how did they finally decide it? They named it the Frank Starling Law. They both got their names on it. So they both had to plant their flag on it, and that is what they did. That Frank Starling Law is that fact that, that, that characteristic that as you stretch the ventricle, it produces more force. 
So, uh, Professor, would you say that there's like a, I guess, for lack of a better term, there's like a golden spot or like, uh, like, yeah, like kind of like a golden spot for like a uh, stretch as far as like uh, efficiency. So if it's sure, overly stretched. Absolutely. So uh, yes, uh, the more it fills, the more powerful it's going to contract, the more blood it is going to pump. Yes. And there would be a point where it would, there would be a point where you'd reach maximal efficiency in that contraction. And if you stretched it beyond that, it would actually become less efficient. Yes, there would be a point like that. All right. So notice both of these things increase the amount of blood we get into the heart, which makes it easier to pump more out, which would increase our stroke volume or make the heart pump more efficiently, which again, will pump more blood out. So both of these affect how much blood we are able to move out of the heart, increasing our stroke volume. So notice both of these preload factors would increase stroke volume. Another way we can increase stroke volume is by affecting the contractility of the heart. Yes, stretching it makes it beat faster or stronger, but as we also know, sympathetic input, adrenaline, things like that can also cause the heart to beat faster and stronger as well. And the stronger it contracts, the more powerful uh, the contraction, the more blood that is gonna be pumped out. Calcium levels, potassium levels, hormones like T3 and T4, uh, are epinephrine, uh, pardon me, not, yeah, epinephrine and norepinephrine, all of those are examples of things that can make the heart beat stronger. And those both can increase drug volume. However, afterload is a factor that can decrease stroke volume. I got rid of my picture here, so let's cheat and draw it small. Here is my ventricle. And remember, the goal of the ventricle is to pump blood out into the artery. So here is our artery. Now, as we know, this artery contains blood. And that blood obviously has a blood pressure. Remember, for our ventricle to eject the blood, it must produce a pressure that is greater than the pressure in the artery. That makes sense? We know that the pressure in the ventricle has to become greater than the pressure in the artery. And when that occurs, we are able to pump blood out. We all comfortable with that idea? Yes. And that's all fine and that's all dandy until you have chronic high blood pressure. If you have chronic high blood pressure, that means that the blood is pushing back on this valve with more pressure. And that means the heart has to work harder. It has to contract stronger. And even though it's working harder and it's contracting stronger, what's gonna happen is our semilunar valve is gonna be open for a shorter period of time. And if it's open for a shorter period of time, how much, what happens to how much blood we're able to pump out? Less blood is pumped out, but exactly. the heart rate goes up. Exactly, less blood is pumped out. As a result of that, you're absolutely right. Our heart rate needs to go up. So now your heart is working harder, it's beating faster, and it's less efficient. Every single pump of the heart moves less blood out 
And that chronic high blood pressure puts tremendous strain on your heart. Because it reduces how much blood you get pumped out with each stroke of the heart. More blood's gonna be left behind. Our end systolic volume is gonna be less and our stroke volume is gonna be less. And I had a pretty picture that goes along with this one too. Again, the ventricle has to overcome the pressure of that blood. And if that pressure in the blood is really high, if you got that high blood pressure, that chronic high blood pressure, that ventricle is having to work harder each and every time to get that blood out. It's also why, as I was mentioning earlier, right, not just our semilunar valves, but in particular, our aortic semilunar valve is the valve that is most likely to fail, most commonly fails, let's say it that way. This valve here is the valve that fails most commonly because it's the one undergoing the greatest pressures, having to deal with the greatest pressures. All right, questions on that? And your book's got this nice flow chart to talk about how all these different changes go on when we exercise that lead to ultimately that increase in cardiac output. So we'll leave all of that. All right, questions on any of this? Excellent, we're doing good on time today. Perfect. So, as I mentioned earlier, the last thing we wanna talk about is that homeostatic imbalance. Our goal is for both sides to pump blood, pump the same amount of blood. All right. And obviously the other thing we need, as it says here, we need to pump enough blood to meet the needs of the body. As we talked about, if you have problems with your sinoatrial node, you might not actually be aware of it. It depends a lot on your lifestyle. If you work in an office where you sit in a chair a lot, if you tend to come home and eat in front of the TV and aren't very active, as we talked about, without your sinoatrial node, your heart can beat somewhere around 40 to 60 beats per minute, and that is enough to keep you alive. You'd only really notice it when you got up to, you know, walk up two flights of stairs or when you, you had to, you know, carry five bags of groceries in the house or some other, exert yourself in some other ways. So basically it's a homeostatic imbalance when we can't meet the needs of the body. We can't meet those demands or there is an imbalance. And typically we call that condition a congestive heart failure. Now, again, this is a gross oversimplification of this, but we're gonna talk about this. And when we talk about blood vessels, we'll talk about some more examples. As I mentioned, often when this congestive heart failure occurs, it typically begins asymmetrically. It's potentially capable of affecting both sides of the heart, but often when it first occurs, it occurs asymmetrically. And that's, if that's the case, then like we said, what happens is that one side isn't moving the same amount of blood as the other. And when we have that types of problems, and I'm gonna cheat, let's do this. When you have pulmonary congestion that leads to a congestive heart failure, which side of the heart fails in that situation? The left right. side. Okay, I've actually heard both answers now, left or right, which one is right. it? Right. right side. Oh. Right side. All right, let's think about it. Excellent, I love that it's about 50-50. I love that, this makes me so happy. All right, excellent, let's think about this. Here is my heart, cut it in half. All right, uh, so let's say for instance, the problem was over here in the left pump. All right, here is the left pump. The left pump receives blood from where again? The lungs. From the right, uh, left IG. Well, well, no, but the left side recedes it from the lungs. And where does it pump blood? To the body. Body. To the body. Excellent. 
Where does the right side receive its blood from? From the body. Dynamic circuit. It receives it from the body. And where does it pump its blood? To lungs. To the lungs. To the lungs. Excellent. Perfect. So let's say that there is a problem with the right side of the heart. Again, we'll use really simple math. Let's say with this really simple math, both ventricles normally pump out 100 milliliters. So in a normal healthy heart, both sides pump out 100 milliliters. But on this side, because of a problem of the heart, now our right side is only pumping out 500 milliliters. Okay? So our right is pumping out 100, our, I mean our left is pumping out 100, but our right is pumping out 50 milliliters. What's going to happen as a result of this? Left side's working away happily, pumping blood efficiently. But the right side only gets rid of 50, leaving 50 behind. And the next time it pumps out, it only leave, pumps out 50, leaving 100 behind. And the next time it pumps out 50, leaving 150 behind. Notice what's going to happen because the right side is less efficient. We are going to get a backup of blood or a congestion of blood. from the right side. And when it backs up, where does it back up to? Into the systemic circulation. Right, it's, yeah, let me make that red. Absolutely, it is going to back up into the systemic circulation. So would that be pulmonary or peripheral congestion? Peripheral. Peripheral, so notice it's when the right side fails that we get peripheral congestion. This is where you get swelling in the fingers, making it harder to take off your ring when you get to the bar at Friday night, right? Your joints become tighter. Your feet get really swollen at night as a, res as a response to things along those lines. However, if we flipped it around and now it is the left side that is having the problems and, it, and it's backing up, when the blood backs up then, where does it back up then? Lungs. Into the lungs. And that would be our pulmonary congestion. So notice left side failure leads to pulmonary congestion. Fluid in the lungs, difficulty breathing, especially when in a laying position, things along those lines are, are challenging from that backing up. I make a point of emphasizing this because as you notice, when we first talked about it, there wasn't consensus. It seems kind of counterintuitive. The left side of the heart pumps the blood to the body, so that should be responsible for peripheral congestion. And the right side pumps to the lung, and that should be responsible for pulmonary congestion. But it's not where they pump the blood to, it's where the blood backs up into. Congestion is just that. That congestion is that backing up, the slowing of the blood flow out of those regions. And so left side failure congests the lungs, right side failure congests the body. So it's, uh, it's where they receive the blood from, correct? Yes, because that's where it's backing up to, right? That's where the line, the queue is forming. We're forming this big, huge line behind it because they can't get out, right? Now, blood can't get out of the left side of the heart, so it backs up, our line backs up into the lungs. But in the instance of um, pulmonary hypertension, it causes right-sided... Um, Heart failure, yes, correct. With, exactly. With a pulmonary hypertension, and let's change the, 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 with a pulmonary hypertension, the blood in the lungs has higher pressure. And so as a result of that, less blood can be pumped out of the right side. And that means it is going to back up So the blood backs up into the, right into the body. So that would lead to a peripheral congestion. So pulmonary hypertension would lead to a peripheral congestion. Whereas systemic hypertension 
can lead to a pulmonary congestion. All right. Like I said, when you first say it out loud, it doesn't seem intuitive. But when you look at the pathways, when you look at the flow chart, hopefully it makes a little bit of sense. Yeah. All right. Questions on that? All right, excellent. That is everything that I wanted to talk about for lecture today. How are we doing on time? We are good on time. What I wanted to do, how are we, uh, let me look at my schedule. So today, there, there, and let's do that. Okay, so let's do that. All right, I do still, because we did, I thought it was useful uh, to go over the blood vessels a little bit of the heart in the last class. I would like to, since we're not getting the class time to do some physiology, to do a little bit more talking about the blood vessels. Again, I'm not gonna take the time to go over all of the blood vessels on our list, but I do wanna talk about some of the idiosyncrasies, some of the asymmetries, some of the more quirky components of it uh, to emphasize those to help you with uh, your blood flow. Uh, and understanding the relationship of blood vessels with each other. I won't take all of the class time to do this, but I would like to take a little bit of time. So let's take a quick break. I will just, we'll, we'll flatten it out and call it a 12 minute break. Come back at 3.50. And at 3.50, uh, we will switch gears into lab mode and talk some more about our blood vessel anatomy. All right, questions on any of this? All right, meet me back here then in 12 minutes at 3.50 and I will get our anatomy stuff set up for our blood vessels. All right, home stretch. We need to finish off our blood vessels. We're not gonna finish off the blood vessels, but finish off the day by talking more about our blood vessels. We left off last time and we'd started talking primarily about our arteries. And in particular, well, we talked about the ascending aorta and the only two blood vessels that come off the ascending aorta, which are the coronary arteries, the right and left coronary arteries. And we talked about how their job is to feed blood to the heart. And we talked about all the pathways associated with that. However, if the blood doesn't leave the ascending aorta out the coronary arteries, it continues on instead into what portion of the blood vessel or what's our next blood vessel on our list? Ascending aorta feeds blood into the aortic arch. Aortic arch, absolutely, the aortic arch. And if we were thinking about the aortic arch, how many different parts of the body does the aortic arch feed blood to? If the ascending aorta feeds blood to the heart, what is our, aor what is our aortic arch feed blood to? The head and arms. Excellent, okay, right arm left arm, just the whole head as one thing in its entirety? Or the different sections of the head. Yeah, a left side of the head and the right side of the head, right? Or right side of the head and left side of the head. So if you think about it, there are four regions of the body that are fed by the aortic arch. The left arm, the left side of the head, the right side of the head, and the right arm, which is why there are four blood vessels that come off the aortic arch. Doesn't that make a lot of sense? Anyone have a problem with that? Four parts of the body, four blood vessels off the aortic arch. Everybody's okay with that? Yeah. Yeah? How about now? You okay with it now? Is everybody not back from break? Is everybody asleep? You guys aren't interested in me doing this. I'm happy to be done for the day. <laughs> All right, let's do the high school version of this. Let's count the blood vessels that come off the aortic arch. How many are there? Three. Three. How many parts of the body do we say it fed? Four. 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 So when I said four parts of the body and four blood vessels coming off the brachiocephalic, I mean off the aortic arch, someone should have had a problem with that, right? 
-hmm. Yes. So how do we reconcile this? How do we reconcile the fact that we need to get to four parts of the body, but there are only three blood vessels that come off of here? Well, there must be some kind of split. True, there must be some kind of split. And let's work our way back. Left subclavian, with a name like left subclavian, where do you think that goes? To the left arm. To the left arm. Left common carotid. The name doesn't kind of give it away, but I think most of us know where the common carotid artery is. Where do you think that goes? Your left, head. Side of the head. left side of the head. Left side of the head. And then we have this one right here. This one right here, again, there's always a lot in a name. Brachiocephalic. And often when we have these alphabet soup terms, the alphabet soup terms tells us everything about it. Brachio refers to what? Arm. 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 Cephalic refers to what? The head. Yes. And there's another giveaway in this blood vessel. Trunk. Trunk. Remember, as we know, a trunk is the name for a large blood vessel or short blood vessel, thick blood vessel, wide in diameter, short and branches almost immediately. So the brachiocephalic trunk is a short blood vessel that branches almost immediately to go to two parts of the body, to the arm and to the head. It's in the name. So this is how. Now, why the asymmetry? I know why in anatomy and physiology is always a question that is a little bit more tricky to understand, but every once in a while we can apply a little logic, and in this case, maybe a little plumber's logic to this, of why we have this asymmetry. Why don't we just have four blood vessels coming off of the aortic arch? The heart is uh, more to the left side. Yeah, absolutely. If we think of this from a plumbing standpoint, the heart is over here on the left side. So it's really easy to go straight up to the head. It's really easy to go straight over to the left arm. But if you want to get to the right side, we need a little bit of extra PVC pipe to get over there. And that's exactly what happens. That brachiocephalic is a little bit of extra PVC pipe to get us over to the right side. Excellent. Now, with the exception of that, for the most part, it is symmetrical uh, on both the left and the right side. So as we see here on the right side, if we were going to go to the arm, that brachiocephalic that comes out feeds into, and again, this is symmetrical on the left and the right from this point forward. Brachiocephalic goes towards the arm, to the subclavian, to the axillary, to the brachial, to the radial and ulnar, to the deep palmar arch, and so on and so forth, all the other ones. Typically, an artery, when it branches, it becomes and forms other branches that come off of it. So we have that there going to the arm. And like I said, there isn't anything particular about those, so I'll let you worry about learning that. What I do want to talk about is what goes on up here going to the head. Remember, the brachiocephalic also needs to go to the right side of the head. So our brachiocephalic trunk, here we see, and let's highlight this. Again, there is the subclavian branch. And then it also forms the common, um, where is it? Come on. The common carotid artery which branches into the internal and external. The external primarily feeds the superficial outer portion of the head. And the internal is what feeds into the brain. Uh, these slides aren't on because it's just lab stuff. So these are mostly pictures from your textbook or pictures very similar to the ones in your textbook or your, and your atlas and other sources like that. So again, I'm just going through the anatomy of this, so I don't really have lecture slides for this. It's just the anatomy slides. All right. So it becomes the, in, the common becomes external and internal. And we'll see that's actually a common uh, anatomical feature that we'll see in a couple other places as well. Uh, there are two other, let me clear my picture here. There are two other blood vessels that I want to point out here that come off of the subclavian. Notice off of the subclavian, and I'm going to go back to my highlighter, but I'm going to make it a little thinner so that we can see this a little clearer. 
here is the subclavian. There are actually two other blood vessels that come off the subclavian. Actually, as you can see, there are many, but two more that you are responsible for. The first is this one that comes up here and goes through those holes in the bones uh, that are making up the neck. Someone remind me, what bones are those again? What bones make up the neck? Cervical vertebrae. Cervical vertebrae, excellent. And remind me again, how many of those you have? Five. Well, five typical, seven. how many total? Seven. seven total, absolutely. Seven total cervical vertebrae. And if I remember correctly, one of the interesting things about the cervical vertebrae is that they had three holes in them. The one big hole for the spinal cord to go through, the vertebral foramen, but it had those two holes on the side which as we see here, stabilize this vertebral artery in place. And what was that hole to the side of our cervical vertebrae that we see our- The transverse. Transverse. Foramen. Yeah, foramen, there you go, excellent. The transverse foramen. Excellent, excellent, excellent. See, all that stuff you learned in 430 actually does have a use. Spectacular, so we see that one there. The other blood vessel you see comes off of it here, and I'm actually gonna cheat and go back to the previous picture because I actually see, think you see it better in the previous picture. In the previous picture, you see, and I gotta move my pictures out of the way. Coming off of the subclavian right here is a blood vessel that goes down the front of the thoracic cavity. And as it goes down the front of the thoracic cavity, this is the internal thoracic artery. And notice it feeds into the intercostal or the costal arteries. The costal arteries sit in an indentation, a notch on the posterior and inferior side of the ribs. Anybody remember what that indentation on the um, backside and underside of the ribs was again? That bone feature is not as familiar. Costal groove. Costal groove is on the underside, right? Forms the inferior uh, margin of the rib, which makes the underside sharp, helps us to tell the left from the right. So that is one that feeds into the thoracic cavity. We'll talk about that one again in just a second but I wanted to point it out here as well. All righty. There. Perfect. All right. Now, as I mentioned, with the exception of the brachiocephalic, you have this symmetry to the two sides. But one of the important characteristics, and I think I actually mentioned this term once before, is a term, an anastomosis. Anastomosis, there you go. Nas no, that's not right. Anastomosis, oh, it was right. Anastomosis, anastomosis. So, great question, Ashley. Remember, you are responsible for every single blood vessel that is on your list. So, for instance, when you look at a picture like this one, um, there are many blood vessels on this list that you're responsible for, not just the ones that I highlighted, but you're not responsible for all of these. Like for instance, you're not responsible for the ophthalmic artery, for instance, but you are the occipital, you are the basilar and things along those lines. So focus on your study guide uh, for which blood vessels you are responsible for. And remember, for your blood vessels, there are five questions you need to be answered. What are those five questions again? Is it oxygen rich? Right, but condition of the blood. So again, you're absolutely correct. But the way I'll ask the question on the exam is identify the condition of the blood in this blood vessel. And so it could either be oxygen rich or oxygen poor. What else? When they feed in. Right, what blood vessel or blood vessels directly feed blood into it? What, what else? Does it feed into? What blood vessel or blood vessels does it, uh, does it immediately uh, feed blood into? Naming it. Is it? Yeah, naming it. Absolutely. You guys left out the heart, the easy one. One more. What's the last one? Direction the blood flows. Yeah, direction the blood flows. 
Does it flow towards the heart or away from the heart? So yes, remember you need to know that for every blood vessel that is on your list. I'm just trying to point out some of the key ones here that are a little quirky. In particular, this anastomosis. Anastomosis, remember, is an elaborate network of blood vessels because as we said, your heart is so dependent on oxygen, you don't necessarily have a square of blood to your heart, but you just want one blood vessel bringing blood to. If it's reliant on just one blood vessel, if anything happens to that blood vessel, that piece of heart is dead. So if we can have lots of blood coming to it from this big elaborate network, or that anastomosis, we can uh, get uh, see good examples. Most anastomoses are venous, as we'll see, but there are some important arterial ones, like in the heart. And what's another tissue like cardiac muscle that doesn't regenerate and is super important? Brain tissue. Brain. And so not surprisingly, one of the most elaborate anastomoses and my personal favorite anastomosis is the Circle of Willis. The Circle of Willis is an anastomosis, an arterial anastomosis, uh, that helps to feed blood uh, continuously to all parts of the brain. As you can see, there are basically four uh, yes, exactly. Named after Bob Willis. There are four blood vessels that bring blood to the brain. As we have already talked about, the two vertebral blood vessels come up off the subclavian and they go that way. And then also here, you can see the internal carotid. So these right here are the internal carotid. So these three blood vessels Actually, you know what? I'm going to do this instead. Let's make that there like that and draw it in more darkly. Here are the two internal carotids and here are the two vertebral. Now, the general pathways of these are pretty straightforward. Notice the two vertebral come together to form a single blood vessel. That is the basilar blood vessel, basilar artery. And the basilar artery then splits to form the two posterior cerebral arteries. And the posterior cerebral arteries are what feed the posterior part of the cerebellum. That's convenient. The internal carotid arteries primarily feed the middle cerebral artery that feeds the middle part of the cerebrum, and it feeds the anterior cerebral arteries that feed the front of the cerebrum. So notice for the most part, blood on the right stays on the right, blood on the left stays on the left. But we don't want small changes in blood pressure as you stand up or sit down or as you tilt your head left or right or as pressure changes slightly change within these blood vessels to change the amount of blood flow. So these blood vessels with these general roots are interconnected by some communicating arteries. Those three communicating arteries are the two posterior communicating arteries right here. And notice this tiny one up here, the anterior communicating artery. So notice these all together, as you can kind of see from the illustration, form a circle, hence the name Circle of Willis, that allow for relatively continuous blood flow throughout this region to make sure that we are evenly distributing blood to all parts of the brain at all times. Because if a part of the brain doesn't get the blood it needs, that part of the brain can die. And what do we typically call that condition? Brain dead? <laughs> well, okay, if it's extreme enough brain dead, but a stroke. stroke. Right? When a portion of the brain is deprived of oxygen because of a blood clot typically or something along those, we call it a, a stroke and suddenly someone can't move their left arm, right? Or can't feel with their left leg or something along those lines. So this circle of Willis is an important anastomosis that helps to regulate blood flow. 
throughout the body. All right. Sorry. Would you say that uh, three arteries give the brain blood or four? Like the two vertebral and two yeah. carotid? Sorry. You're right. Four blood vessels feed it in. You've got the two vertebral and the two, the, so the right and left vertebral, the right and left uh, internal carotids. But as you notice, the two vertebral do feed into the one basilar. Yeah. So that one basilar that comes up the pons, if you notice, that big enlargement that is the pons, and then branches from there. So would it, it would be four then? Yeah, I think four is fine. If you, you could make an argument either way. You could make an argument that it is four in that you have the two internal carotids and the two vertebral. But someone else could say, no, it's actually three. It is the two internal uh, carotids and then the basilar that feeds into it. And again, you could, so again, either way, however you wanted to describe that, I'd be fine with it either way. And uh, uh, was it for those, uh, for those arteries, those are uh, all left and right, correct? Yes, exactly. Because remember, this is an inferior view. So this over here is all the right and this over here is all the left. So right over here, left over here, because again, this is an inferior view. All right, and remember, left and right matters on the exam. There's nothing I hate more than on an exam if I have an arrow pointing uh, right here, identify that blood vessel, and on the exam, you put posterior communicating, which is the hard part, and that's awesome, but you forget to put right, and I have to give you partial credit, that makes me very sad. So don't make me sad by getting the hard part correct and screwing up the easy part. Remember to say right and left. Remember to write artery and vein. Okay? Questions on that? All right, excellent. I think that's a good stopping point. We still have a few more arteries to go and we have all the veins to go. But I think uh, looking at the schedule, I think we have enough time on Thursday where we should be able to get through most of it, if not all of it. Uh, before by uh, on Thursday because I know your cardiovascular exercises are due on Tuesday so I'd like to get them done by now but whether we get them done or not you're still turning in that cardiovascular exercise on Tuesday but the more we go over this the more you go over it the more comfortable you are with the material the easier it will be for you to be able to answer those questions all right uh, do, do, do. so the full answer would be uh, right posterior communicating artery that is correct All right. Any other questions? All right. I think that is enough material for today. This is a good stopping point. So again, uh, have a good, safe day, and I will see you on Thursday. Bye. Thank you. Right. Last call. Bye. Thank questions? you. All right. You guys, be happy, be safe, and I will see you on Thursday. Professor, I had a question. Yes. But it was more like of a, a not a of the class. So I was wondering, if, would you be able to